Welcome to the PewterCast. Today is Monday, May 29th, 2017, and this is episode 36, Phase 2 Begins. I'm Brent Allen, your host, joined as always by my co-host, Ren Dax. Ren, how you doing, my friend? Doing good. These two weeks between podcasts are starting to kill me. Every time a story comes out of one buck, I want to shoot you a text and be like, hey, you want to go on? You want to go on? <laughs> But I think instead we, of doing that, I think we ahead. actually did that over like last week, like on Monday. We're like, hey, let's get on. There's been a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah. So instead of doing that, we decided to put it all together. We're going to give you our thoughts on all the news that's come out of one buck the past two weeks. Yeah, it should be should be definitely a very fun episode. As Ren said that, uh, you know, there's been a lot of things that have come out in the last two weeks. Uh, things that we just, uh, you know, we couldn't cover this in just some little tiny segment towards the end of a show. Um, and we don't do that at the end of the shows anymore. So, uh, so that's what we're going to be talking about today, guys, uh, is really just taking a look at what has been coming out of one buck place over the last two weeks since our last episode, which by the way, at least one of those topics will change, uh, because last time we talked about the camp roster and, uh, there is one major move that will change our prediction for the camp roster. Uh, or for for what happens with the roster. So can't wait to get into that. And then for our top three segment, we're going to be talking about our top three insights from the position coaches, uh, things that we heard out of their press conferences and uh, what they have given us. So uh, really cool stuff coming up for that. And then we'll wrap up the show with a few words from you guys, our listeners, in our fan interaction segment. All of that is coming your way on this episode of the PeterCast. Welcome back to the PewterCast. This is episode 36, phase two begins. Now, Ren, you and I were just talking about the differences in some of these different phases. Phase two of OTAs uh, is officially kicked off. We've had our first week of that. We're getting ready to run into our second week. And uh, tons and tons of stuff has really come out. We've gotten to finally see guys in drills. Uh, we've seen video of you know certain people catching interceptions, and then other people just burning other guys, and and uh, you know completions of Jameis to OJ Howard, and uh, you know we're seeing uh, some familiar faces finally back around one buck place. Um, so lots of stuff that has come out uh, just in these last couple of weeks here as phase two of OTAs has begun. Um, and one of those things is even, uh, going to impact. We mentioned this in the opening segment, uh, the, the 90 man roster. We, we talked on our last episode, episode 35 about the camp roster and, uh, made some predictions as far as what that's going to go. So, uh, as far as what that's going to do, uh, with the camp roster as we go into the 53 man roster later on, uh, away, Ren, I think you said it on Twitter earlier this week, a way too early prediction for the 53 roster. Yes, obviously. Since three days later, it, it changed. Yes. So uh, we'll be taking a look at those headlines uh, really just since the last episode, um, which is probably the best way to cover most of what's been happening in, in Buck World. Um, now, I, I would say that uh, some of these things may even change, you know, as new things come out here over the couple next couple of weeks. So uh, no particular order to these things. We just kind of jotted down some of the headlines that we've seen come out uh, or just some of the fun, fun, interactive things that have been happening. So uh, we'll tackle these uh, kind of one by one. Of course, I think the big one that has happened, Ren, I'd love to get your thoughts the Tampa Bay Buccaneers signed quarterback Ryan Fitzpatrick, and we released Sean Renfrey. Uh, thoughts on that, sir? Yeah, this has been – we've kind of been messing around with the Bucks bringing in a, a veteran backup uh, uh, to get an extra set of eyes for Jameis, a sounding board for Jameis uh, for a while. I believe uh, it started when Craig in Vegas called in uh, to one of our call-in shows, and he brought it yeah. up, so we've been kind of kicking it back and forth. Uh, what to do. And I even 
quickly mentioned it in the uh, fan uh, interaction segment of the last uh, podcast. I uh, actually used Ryan uh, Fitzpatrick's name. Now, I totally lucked into it because it happened. Um, right. So, yeah, I like it. It was w- it. It was a big question, which one, you know, tells how better your roster is from just even a year ago before Jason Light got here, where one of the main topics of conversation is who's going to be the backup quarterback. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, it changed to to now there is no conversation about who's going to be the backup quarterback. I know Dirk Cutter came out and said that, you know, Ryan Griffin's still competing for the number two spot and. You know, just the guy inside the helmet change. You know, you're you're still going, you're still competing, but uh, I don't think that uh, unless Ryan Griffin falls totally on his face or gets injured, he's going to be the quarterback. Just for the reasons I mentioned at the beginning, uh, a sounding board and an extra set of eyes. You know, he's seen it all. He's right. you know, he's got yeah, he's got uh, lots of games, lots of passes, lots of starts in the league. So you know. I like it, and anybody that uh, teaches classes to, uh, you know, how to solve the Rubik's cube, he's kind of a he's a special kind of smart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't. If you guys didn't see, you can go to Buccaneers dot com and you can see a video of Ryan Fitzpatrick uh, trying to solve the Rubik's cube in under a minute. I think he did it in like a minute fourteen. Spoiler alert. Um, but uh, yeah, he did it. Um, <laughs> goes and, it goes the other way, Brent. Something like that. Spoil, yeah. Spoil, spoiler alert before. before? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. My I mean, bad. I don't know. My, okay, let's try it again. Spoiler alert. He actually does it in a minute 14. Um, the Bucks take OJ Howard. Right. Hey, that was Rick Stroud, not me. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for anyone who doesn't know, I said I was back when we did our, our live uh, uh, call in show for the draft, and uh, we were waiting for it. And I was hoping, I actually asked that no one ruin it for us and uh brent accidentally read a tweet that actually came to be true so i'm just teasing him because he spoiled the first round pick for me so that's what's going on with that i still feel just a a little bit bad but you just made me feel a little bit better about it so i feel a little less bad now (laughs) Um, good so uh so yeah ryan fitzpatrick you know i i think there's two things that uh that that come up when when you're talking about this like there there's the one question of how many quarterbacks will we now keep on the roster? Um, Cause it, it seems apparent that unless Ryan Fitzpatrick fully falls on his face, he will be on this roster uh, for at least the 2017 season. So you got Jameis, you got Ryan Fitzpatrick. Will we do that thing where we keep Ryan Griffin or a third quarterback again on the roster and just keep them inactive the entire year? Or is this the year that we go to uh, to a two man uh, quarterback system like the rest of the NFL does? And then the other question being of the, uh, veteran free agent quarterbacks that are available was Ryan Fitzpatrick really the best guy uh, to bring in? I think it, uh, those are kind of the two questions. I think when weighing this whole thing out, I think it makes sense. Like the overall idea of bringing in a veteran quarterback um, to give a guy like Jameis, who's only in his third year, uh, really that that extra set of eyes. And when we talk about that, what I really go back to is is uh, last year at the Atlanta game. I was able to look down because uh, I was sitting right behind the uh, right behind the the Bucks bench, and I was watching Evan Smith coaching the offensive line guys. Like he was giving them advice of what he was seeing. Like I could visually see him doing that. So uh, to have a quarterback who can do that for Jameis uh, just makes all the sense in the world to me. And maybe even do it on a level that Mike Glennon never could. Um, but is is it Ryan Fitzpatrick? Colin Kaepernick certainly is another one uh, that has been out there uh, on that. Um, Ren, any thoughts on you know did we get the right guy in Ryan Ryan Fitzpatrick or what you know should we have really gone after Kaepernick? What what are your thoughts on that? Well, I'm not a general manager nor a pro scout nor uh, a guy that that does a lot of draft stuff on Twitter, but if you're taking it face value. Patrick's the guy as far as scheme fit. You know, he's a pocket passer, uh, likes to drive the ball downfield. Um, Kaepernick just came from a, a, a quick hitting slant, uh, sort of like Sam Bradford type of offense. They run there in Minnesota where everything's like, you know, plant, plant your foot and let it go. Everything's on, on, on a lot of timing routes, short slants, screens, uh, things like that. The ball doesn't travel that far in the air. 
uh, to get to the receiver. And Fitzpatrick, you know, he came from a more of a of a deep running route offense. And like I said, he's he's a he's a pocket passer and likes to drive the ball down the field. So scheme wise, yeah, you know, Fitzpatrick's the guy. Uh, if you're looking for someone who's more athletic and you know can make something out of nothing, uh, then I guess Kopech, uh, uh, um Kaepernick. Thank you. <laughs> Kaepernick. <laughs> Blank. Uh, Kaepernick's your guy. But uh, for me, you know, as a Bucks fan, um, I I like the move as far as keeping your guys in the same system. And mostly because of what we talked about earlier, or I talked about earlier, it's his experience and, and seeing um, a lot of things in the NFL. And just like you talked about with Evan Smith, like telling the, the O-line what, what he was seeing mm-hmm. from the sidelines uh, – he could do the same thing with Jameis because, you know, not only Dirk Cutter is the offensive coordinator, but he's also the head coach. So there's a lot of other stuff uh, going on uh, for him when the defense is out there than just like another regular uh, offensive coordinator. So if you're going to make me choose between those two guys, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go with who the Bucks took. I'm taking Fitzpatrick. Yeah, it, it's I've thought a lot about that here over the last couple of weeks, and I know different people have different thoughts and opinions. And hey, if you're listening out there, you can shoot us your thoughts and opinions uh, to our Twitter, uh, email, Facebook, whatever. I uh, would love to know what you guys think. Uh, for me, I don't really care because it's the backup guy. You know, like this is a guy <laughs> that we hope doesn't actually see the field. And if you're talking about uh, if you're talking about somebody who has been there, who has seen it. I truly I don't necessarily understand why Fitzpatrick was um, a free agent quarterback still because uh, I thought he did pretty well, you know, in his time with the Jets. And, you know, I understand whatever, you know, weird things happened up there that, that he didn't get re-signed uh, or he held out for money. I don't know what it was, but um, he's just a guy that I always kind of had had as a question mark as to why he's, you know, why he's floating around out there. We know that Kaepernick asked to be released from his team and that's why he was out there um but you know like i say between the two guys yeah i don't really care it's it's i'll 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 go with you on that ren you know he comes from a better scheme fit and and uh uh so we go with that now as far as do we just roll with the two or do we keep a third man on the roster because that certainly you know that eat up another roster spot um what do you think we do and if you think we keep it where does that roster spot come from? Uh, I tweeted this out when, before the uh, deal for Fitzpatrick was out. I said if it's if it's like a three year deal, then you can you know pretty much kiss uh, Ryan Griffin goodbye. Uh, but it's not; it's a one year deal. So I think it all depends on how his his uh, training camp goes. If he doesn't show improvement to what the Bucks think he should be. Uh, if his if his arrow isn't trending up enough where the Bucks think it should be, then I think they go with two. Um, now it's a whole different discussion: is do they go with a 52 man roster again this year and protect him again, like they did the past two years? Talking, of course, of, of Ryan Griffin, or do they uh, just put him on the practice squad? But I'm not even sure he can be on the practice squad anymore. Uh, Ryan Be Griffin. Honest. Ryan Griffin is no longer practice squad eligible. So yeah, so it's either carry him or cut him. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's that's all going to be. And unless they have, uh, it's just the backup quarterback. Now that I'm talking myself through it, <laughs> I think I, th- I think they're going to go with two. And uh, if Ryan doesn't win the uh, the the uh, excuse me, backup quarterback spot, then I think it, I think it's last day. I think it's days are numbered. Uh, yeah, so I think they're going to go with two, and it's going to be Fitzpatrick and Winston. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you on that. I do think that they'll stay with two, which then therefore doesn't change you know, our board uh, that we had had there. And I, I could see us actually releasing Ryan Griffin, uh, but uh, Sia Leafu? Saley, how you ever say his name? He is, as far as I understand, he is still practice squad eligible, and he might be a guy that we look to to you know stash on the practice squad, um, you know, and hopefully nobody steals him out from under us because uh, it is a little concerning the idea that it's only a one year, um, you know, a one year deal. But I can understand, you know, Ryan Griffin uh, or Ryan Fitzpatrick is it 
I think he still could be a starting caliber quarterback in the league, possibly, maybe in a in a quarter. You know, if there's a quarterback need somewhere, um, that that you know he may want to keep those options open. I could certainly understand that being a case for him. So, uh, so Buck signed Ryan Fitzpatrick. Overall, I think we like it. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, Remember when we were trying to say some of the uh, undrafted free agents' names uh, last week, and I said someone's going to kill us for that? Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, uh, Greg Allman, beat writer for the Times, who uh, was nice enough to tweet out our podcast last year to retweet it, uh, he actually sent me this. <laughs> he said, uh, Sifu Lofau. Okay. He broke it down phonetically for us. Yeah, it was just like out of nowhere. He's like, oh, by the way. <laughs> Sifu Lofau, huh? S-S-E-H hyphen F-O-H and then capital L-O-O hyphen F-O-W. So huh. Sifu Lofau. Wow. Is okay. that fourth quarterback that we were talking about, who is a camp arm and, uh, like you said, might be uh, stashed away on the practice squad. Is it bad for that your I- start? Is it bad that I hope we don't keep him so I don't have to learn that name? Uh, no, because I've heard the same things about, you know, uh, when they drafted uh, Stevie Tui T. Huavatu. Yeah, yeah Stevie T. It wasn't so much learning it, but a lot of, you know, the guys were the guys like like I'm in their group. A lot of the beat reporters, <laughs> me and the guys hanging right out in now. the press room at one buck place. <laughs> uh, they, uh, they, they don't like to having to type that, basically. You know, anytime they do a piece and he's mentioned in it, you mm-hmm. gotta type out, you know, Tui Kolovatu. They're kind of like rolling their eyes, like, uh. But, uh. So, okay, so is it bad that I wanna, I hope we do keep, uh, Stevie tu- Tui Kolovatu because I can say his last name and I don't actually have to type it? But I wanna no, see those other guys struggle. <laughs> and it's, and it's not, it's not even, it's, it's not even terrible that, you know, you wanna see, uh, uh, Lofau actually move up the road. Except for you're probably never really going to have to hear – you're probably going to have to say his name all year unless you know there's an injury. And even if there's an injury, I would – willing to bet the Bucks would find some other uh, – sorry, some other veteran out there mm-hmm. that's uh, walking the streets and they could bring in um, – because I don't think, think Lofau is anywhere close to be able to even – Right to take an NFL snap in a game. Right. Well, we'll just see how many times we get to talk about them while we're watching Hard Knocks, which you guys can follow our new thing on at Talking Hard Knocks uh, for uh, coming up later on this summer when the Bucks go to Hard Knocks with their new show that will be rolling out during that time. So um, live Colin show. There we go. Live Colin show following each episode right after. So uh, should be super fun. Uh, let's move on. Uh, let's talk about another. Uh, Let's talk about Deshaun Jackson. What do you say? Uh, there was a video that came out that showed Deshaun Jackson burning Vernon Hargraves the third, uh, going down the field catching a pass, and and I mean left Vernon sucking his thumb like it was it was ridiculous. Uh, I know a couple people have talked about it. A lot of people, um, you know, a lot of people have kind of some people turned on VH three after that, and some people just praised Dexter Jackson. Um, any thoughts, uh, watching that video of, of DJX burning VH3? No, it was absolutely no big deal. I mean, yeah. it, it was basically, <laughs> it was all the VH3 haters, Seminole fans that, uh, it gave them the, the, uh, the outlet to pounce, you know, it's like, it was, I kind of refer it back to the Tom Jones, Jameis, uh, Winston article at the elementary school. Like you didn't hear from all these people, about you know the negative stuff about Jameis until like he quote unquote messed up and then they all come out of the woodwork. See, I told you, blah blah blah. And that's kind of the same thing that happened with Vernon. I I, I take less than zero, uh, anything like it's nothing. Like it's less than nothing about what mm-hmm. happened. Yeah, he beat him. Okay. Yeah, they're in shorts. That you know, you know, it's whatever. It it's gonna happen hey, you know not only did he no, beat him let's as there's no contact you're not allowed to make contact at, at this yeah point. It, he so. can't even put his hands on him there's a lot yeah so uh i was shocked though uh surprised if you will the amount of like vh3 is the worst you know vernon stinks waits a draft pick and i'm just like what yeah and it got yeah it got so bad where uh you know e- even gill 
uh, who does the Saturday column for uh, Joe Buck's fan, you know, if that was a Saturday column, like, what are you guys doing? Like, right. come on now, like, <laughs> calm down. So, <clears throat> like I said, it was just an opportunity for for federal fans to pounce on uh, Vernon. And uh, because let's face it, he didn't have a superb year. Uh, he didn't have a great year. Uh, did he have a good year? Mm, debatable. Mm. But, I thought uh, he had a rookie you know, year. Does there that, you go. Does that make, it, was a, it was a rookie year. Rookie year. Your rookie cornerback year. Yeah. Playing alongside a guy that should have went to the Pro Bowl. Right. Uh, so, yeah, I, I'm definitely like, yeah, if Vernon needs to do, you know, a lot more things before I even begin to raise my eyebrow or get worried about his play. So, yeah, I take, for, as far as that, uh, yeah, that, that, uh, Djax clip and him, I, I take absolutely zero nothing from it whatsoever. Yeah, I would I would agree with you, and I would just say, hey, listen, uh, it was a fun clip. It, it shows us great stuff that Dexter Jackson could have coming out of you know what we could expect out of De- Dexter Jackson. Showed us nothing about VH3. However, if people want to talk about VH3, let's talk about the two interceptions in two days that he had over the course of the last week as well. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, to be fair, it seemed that. He did that a lot in training camp last year too. Mm-hmm. I think he led uh, he led the team in picks uh, during training camp, but he definitely didn't you know lead it during the regular season. Um, but they're talk but they've talked to him about that. Anytime you hear the coaches talk about Vernon, it's they want him to press more, play up more, trust mm-hmm. his instincts, trust what he sees, and you know he just needs better play recognition and uh, better understanding of the way teams are going to attack him. And, yeah. uh, I, and I, I think he's a smart guy, and uh, obviously he's got the talent. Uh, I saw a tweet the other day that if Vernon was in this uh, cornerback class this year, which was highly touted, uh, someone who I respect as far as as, as a uh, as a draft guy and breaking down film, said that that V8 that Vernon would have been the number one cornerback in this year's draft. So, like I said, I have no worries about it. And I, I do expect a big jump in his play from last year to this year. So so let's talk about that and just kind of nail that down. What would be the right like step function for Vernon going into his second year? And, you know, if we have to compare that, let's you know, let's take Mike Evans. So he comes in. Mike Evans, obviously an elite player. Um, it has an amazing first year. Uh, comes out for his second year, um, actually beats all of his numbers, including the number of his dropped passes. But he still beat all of his except numbers, with, except for touchdowns, except for touchdowns. Right. Yeah. The one that actually matters uh, to the games. Um, Fantasy flares. Right. So so, you know, going from second year to third year, Mike Evans, big thing was stop dropping the ball going from his third year to his fourth year this year. The thing we keep hearing about is him improving his his yards after catch, uh, you mm-hmm. know, so actually getting up. So what would be the right step function for us to see in Vernon this year going from his first year to his second year? Uh Probably a, this is what I would look for. I would look for more three and four wide receiver sets against the Bucks to spread them out. Um, they're going to attack Vernon early in the year, and until he proves that uh, it's not a good idea, no one's going to throw at Grimes. So they're going to get three wide receivers on the field and possibly four to spread them out so they can attack uh, the slot and uh, possibly safety or their uh, third best outside corner. Which at this point, you know, just spitballing is probably Ryan Ryan Smith. Um, mm-hmm. So that would that would indicate to me that the teams don't think they can pick on Vernon like they did last year, and so now they're trying different things to get mismatches on the field, and that would be one thing to look for. Uh, just for him to play tighter, um, more, I guess, contested. He's a great tackler. Tackular. He's spectacular tackular. Uh, he's a very good tackler, uh, especially for his position. Uh, I think he supports the run well. And it seemed last year he was really worried about just keeping the ball in front of him, uh, letting the guy catch the ball, make the tackle, move mm-hmm. on to the next play. Uh, I expect a lot more challenges from him coming this year. 
Yeah, I, that I mean, that's the thing that keeps coming back to my mind. And and we said it as a whole, or at least I said it as a whole for the defense last year was uh, at least in the first part of the season. It seemed like they were they were waiting for something to happen and then reacting as opposed to being proactive. And that's what I'd like to see out of out of VH, not just VH3, but everybody, but specifically from him uh, to what you just said, more challenges. I want to see him more proactive as opposed to just waiting for something to happen and then making the tackles. So, um, all right, let's move on to another player that uh, people love to talk about around Buccaneers time, uh, about around Buccaneers town. Uh, Roberto Aguayo goes out in his first day, misses three of his four kicks, while Nick Folk makes them all. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we'll go to say, and then the next day, uh, Aguayo went out, made all of his kicks and, uh, folk missed a couple. Um, you know, it was really interesting. Everybody wanted to talk about him missing his kicks on his first day, but they didn't really talk about, you know, what happened on the second day. So, um, Roberto Aguayo, Nick folk, uh, what do we think? I don't know where you're getting your numbers from because, uh, I think he went did he go two for five or one for five on his first day? That doesn't really matter. The, the part that that's, he actually went four for five on the second day. Uh, and Nick and Nick folk didn't miss any. So Nick hasn't missed yet. I'm not sure where you're getting or, or Nick missed a few. I know that's what that's what I'm the same way. You're going eh, and I'm back at you like, eh. so because so. <laughs> I don't think so either. And because this is because. This is the tweet that I saw. I mean, and there it was funny. They were like stacked on my on my Twitter line, like like one on top of another. And I actually took a picture and tweeted it out. The top one, and I might get the numbers wrong, so uh, I apologize. Uh, the top one was Rick Stroud, and I believe he said that Aguayo went five for five. And then right under that was Peter Report Scott Reynolds, and it said Aguayo went four for five. And then the one under that was Joe Buck's fan. And it said Aguayo made four. Not sure about the like. Not sure about one. Basically, he kicked it too high, or not too high, but he kicked it high enough where where uh, you couldn't tell if it went over the goalpost or outside of the goalpost. And Dirk Cutter actually clarified after practice that he did miss it. So, as far as I know, and I'm not sure. Like I'm saying, like you know, whatever you read or, or what's going on, you know, thousands of miles away, all the way from, you know up in South Carolina, you're surrounded by Panthers fans and me <laughs> with boots on the ground here in the Bay area. Uh, I'm not sure where you're getting your information. No. Um, yeah. Okay. It's, wow. So, you know what? This is an edited show. I am probably not going to edit this part out. Uh, no, you're, you're absolutely <laughs> right. Because I, I swear up and down my hand on a Bible that I saw that uh, Aguayo went out, missed it was, he missed he missed three of his four kicks his first day. Nick Folk went four for four, um, which I'm looking at a tweet five, right now. Five, no, it's four. Five. I'm looking. I'm looking at Rick Stroud right now, saying okay. it's one for four, and then Nick Folk was four for four. But then I swear up and down that I saw the next day that Roberto Aguayo went out and he was perfect the next day, but Folk missed a few. However, uh, looking at something that was just updated, uh, it said Bucks kicker Roberto Aguayo went five for nine on his uh, field goals during OTAs last week. So the whole week. Went five for nine while his competition, Nick Folk, was nine for nine. Um, so you're right. I'm wrong. But still, all of that doesn't matter. <laughs> Let's talk about Roberto Aguayo going five for nine while Nick Folk went nine for nine. Uh, shocking, I guess. Uh, you know, the first one uh, where they kicked four, where, you know, Aguayo went one for four and uh, Folk went four for four, was against the skinny post. Mm-hmm. Um that was basically they're kind of like the same width as an arena league football. I think make their 10 yards roughly apart. So uh, he could have made all four on regulation. Aguayo mm-hmm. talking about Aguayo, but Nick Folk like made all of his. And then the next day, like I said, uh, but uh, you know, like I said, Aguayo looked like he made all five, but there was some discrepancy and officially he missed that one. But the difference is folks like, there is no discrepancy with his. He drilled him right down the middle, high mm-hmm. on the net, skinny post. Drilled him right down the middle, you know, high on the net, regulation post. So uh, we've talked a little bit about before. I've said I think it's it's Nick Folt's job to lose, and uh, 
I don't think it's really going to be much of a competition. I heard uh, Scott Reynolds from Pewter Report today talking on the radio down here, uh, 620, that Aguayo's going to stick around because what happens if you know Mick, Nick Folk you know, injures himself during mm-hmm. training camp or during right. a preseason game? So you need somebody to be there to back up, and especially since you don't have to do that middle cut anymore right. with the rule changes where you can yeah keep them all and then go woom, all the way down to, to uh there's like no down to 75 you go from 90 to 53 uh so you can afford you know those luxury add-ons and, and keep-ons and and guys that you know you're going to play just the fourth preseason game the whole entire game but have no chance making the team but you don't have to you know there's nobody <clears throat> uh none of your starters get injured and things like that so uh I think Aguayo is going to stick around. He could turn it around. You know, Nick Folk could start going south, but yeah. you know, early indications is he's busted from the gate and he's got you know four or five horse length lead on Aguayo, and uh, and it, it's starting to rain. Yeah, it, it's to your point. The idea that that the Bucks would cut Aguayo before the ninety men cut down to fifty three this year is is ridiculous to me. There's zero reason for them to do that. Um, just, just let the competition play out the way it needs to play out. But, um, you know, as I'm always one to defend Roberto Aguayo, you know, when you look, you say, you say he went five for nine and that seems really, really bad, which means he missed four, three of those four were on the first day. So he only missed one on the next day. That's an improvement. Um, (laughs) <laughs> Hashtag I'm with 19, maybe. There you go. I don't know. Hey, I mean, you're right. No, I mean, yeah, you know. You know, yeah. he, he only missed. I mean, he got better, right? It got better. He did. Um, <laughs> that's, 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 but, you know, here's, I'm here's going the, for a walk later. Right. But, I mean, here's the thing. You're in the middle of a game. You need a guy. The, you know, the question is, is, do we go for it or do we take the sure points? Um but if you're not sure of your field goal kicker, it's not sure points. Like it really changes that conversation. And I think it changed the conversation for, for cutter quite a few times last year as to what we would do when we got into that situation. You've got to have somebody who, who you just rely on, who is automatic. Now I think going forward and this is the, this will be the thing I say to watch about that. I agree with you. I think this is probably going to be Nick folks job to lose. Um, they're not going to cut anybody before the 90 man cut down. So, uh, you know, we don't have to see that it is possible. It is conceivably possible that even barring injury that Nick, Nick folk just sort of starts to tank. And uh, let's say Aguayo goes perfect from here on out through the entire rest of the preseason. Um, you know, does that shift things? Does that, does that move things around? I, I don't know. I, you know, that's, uh, I don't know. Makes well, it makes it harder. Makes it definitely it harder makes it harder. That's for yeah. sure. Yeah, but you know, I mean, if if Aguayo is still going, you know, sixty percent on his kicks, seventy percent on his kicks, uh, you know, that's going to be a no brainer. And uh, you know, at some point, you just got to cut your losses and and move on, second round pick or not, um, trade it up to get him or not. It, it, you know, it, it's it's just one of those things. I, you know, you and I, if we had to put money on, I think we'd predict Nick Folk will be our kicker in this next year. If we had to do it right now, today, um, I'm just saying it's not out of the realm of possibility that Roberto could really turn this around. Uh, and we'll get to this in our next segment. When we're talking about our position coaches, but, um, you know, watching and seeing what is it that, you know, what's speaking of that step function into your second year, what is the step function that Roberto Aguayo is going to start taking? Uh, and is it going to be enough to keep him on this team? Uh, well, we've got, uh, we've got a couple months to figure that out. So, um, yeah. And I will say this, that, um, before they got into that, that little, uh, the thing where they started actually counting the kicks, uh, according to Mark cook, maybe Scott Reynolds, I don't know. One of those guys who was there watching them, they said that, that Aguayo and folk were both nailing them like in practice, like all day, they, they were both just draining them right down the middle. Um, you know, and it was, it was Roberto got out there and something weird happened. And so like he overcorrected and then he overcorrected back the other way and then he got it back into the middle. So, you know, uh, but they were nailing them, you know, all day before that. So, you know, uh, it's not like they only had four kicks each the entire day, you know, they, they were continuing to kick. So I don't know. We'll see what happens. Um, interesting show to watch. We will talk more about it. I'm sure. 
on Talking Hard Knocks, the new show coming up. Yeah, right. Right. <laughs> Can I get that plug in <laughs> anymore? I'm gonna stop that. All right. Uh, let's see here. What else? Um, Jr. Sweezy, the Sweeze is back. Um, the Sweeze. Uh, um, they're saying he's looking great. They're saying he's bringing just a whole lot of tenacity um, to to the offensive line. Um, it definitely looks like he is. Uh, you know, barring injury, uh, he's going to be our starting, uh, our starting guard this year. Uh, thoughts on Jarrett Sweezy? Just, you know, I put this one in here cause I'm just glad he's there. Like, uh, this mm-hmm. is the first time I remember him even, I don't even know what his voice sounded like. You know, he was injured so early mm-hmm. and, uh, was off the radar so quickly. We didn't really know anything about him as a player. You always heard, well, he's like a road grader as a run blocker, but you know, his pass protection needs, you know, improvement. <clears throat> we'll see if that comes true, but, uh, uh, everyone's speaking really highly of him. Um, I think the, but, uh, the Bucks coaching staff and, uh, especially George Warhop is glad he's there. Uh, I think he brings some kind of like nastiness that's, that's sort of been lost since, uh, you know, Logan Mankins called it quits. Mm -hmm. Uh, so yeah, it was just nice to hear from him and, and, and kind of gauge what kind of personality he has because he's been on the team, but it's, you know, it's like the guy that's, that's been sent to the North pole. It's like, Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, I'm, he's on the roster and I'm paying him money, but I, 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 I don't know. I don't know anything about him. So it was just cool to see him at practice and hear that he's doing well. And, you know, uh, get a quick interview with him, with him, and uh, and hear what he had to say, and things like that. That's why I put that on there because uh, it was pretty much, basically, as far as I can remember, even him, uh, you know, talking. I'm sure if you go back and and look when he was signed as a free agent, I'm sure he, you know, he had one a podium day with uh, with uh, Jason Light and Dirk Cutter, but I, I don't remember it. So mm-hmm. uh, it was just like I said, it was just nice to hear from him. Yeah, it's it's it, the thing that that I have a that the big thought that I have is is I wonder how he's going to fit into the chemistry of the team because I I never got the feeling that even though he was quote unquote on the team that he was around the team last year. Um, so yeah, he you know, wasn't right. So he was he was just gone. I mean, it, he might have been and he was just hiding from the media the whole time. Like maybe he had no, an invisibility was, cloak he, on or something. I don't know. Uh, yeah, he but was he wasn't California. around California. Oh, from was what he? I, from what I remember, nice. yeah, he, like he wasn't even in the state. Wow. So you know, he'd come back in and check in and things, but as right. far as like day to day, not like like Vincent Jackson was around, right? You know, uh, but yeah, Sweezy, yeah, Sweezy was Sweezy. gone. So you know, how's the chemistry going to work on the on the offensive line? Um, you know, I don't think I I'm not predicting it to be bad. I'm just curious as to how that is going to play out because there was certainly uh, you know if you remember that offensive line from a couple years ago that just completely surprised us. Uh, it was Logan Mankins last year. Like there was just something about that group, you know, the, the way that that particular offensive line group worked. Um, and I think that was, that was Donovan Smith and Alley's uh, rookie year as well. Um, you know, so it certainly wasn't perfect by any means, but uh, something happens when a chemistry locks in, especially with a group as tight as an offensive line. Uh, so I'll be interested to see what happens with Sweezy out of that. Uh, the one thing I think about with Sweezy though, is kind of the same thing I think about with a guy like Devonte bond and even Jacky Smith, uh, just remembering that we didn't have them last year, and while they're not free agent signings this year, they're not draft picks this year or anything like that, they kind of are. Like this is kind of their first season with us, uh, or at least first season back with us. We we're getting them back, so um, you know these these just aren't people we had last year uh, that were available. So um, you know it'll be interesting to see how they fit in and um, you know what they're going to bring to this team. So uh, should be. It should be something pretty fun. All right. Uh, what else do we have? Um, this one stirred up a little bit of controversy this week uh, in these last couple of weeks. Uh, offensive coordinator Todd Munkin um, made a little comment to the press uh, saying that, uh, you know, Dexter Jackson came here uh, because of the money. We paid him well, and now he needs to play, and he needs to play well now. Uh, and, uh, that set off a firestorm. Lots of people had lots and lots of opinions on whether, uh, he said the right thing or shouldn't have said it. And even Dexter Jackson seemed to have a little bit of a comeback to that. Uh, any thoughts on this whole, this whole situation, uh, is trouble brewing on the offense there? Uh, you think? No, I, I make, I mean, I, I make less of this than 
uh, than I than the uh, Deshaun Jackson Vernon <laughs> infamous infamous burn the burn tape. right. I you know uh, that's just Munkin. That's it, and he's absolutely right. You know, uh, I don't really know why he brought it up or said it, but in this world that we live in now, that's very PC driven. Um, it's really not in an NFL organization. <laughs> uh, it's kind of something that, that kind of opens your eyes at hard knocks. Uh, if you've ever watched it, I know, I know you're not a bit, you haven't watched much of it, but, uh, but the language and, and the way that they talk to each other, it, it's, it's, it would not be like those guys would be in, in the PR department every day if they work for another company. And that's just <laughs> the way it is. So, you know, saying like, well, don't give me that crap. You came down here to play with Jameis and you love the weather and, and you know, it's a, a <clears throat> no state tax. It's like you came here because we paid you the most money and now it's time for you to go out in the field and show it. And uh, I don't have a problem with that whatsoever. Um, I think every Bucks fan, that's exactly the way they feel. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe they wouldn't say the first part, but definitely like the end part, like, look, you know, we're giving you $11 million a year. You need to go out and, you, you know, you need to be the player you have been. Uh, you know, we're not paying you to, uh, there's no, what do you say? There's no cachet with us. You know, this is a new team. You haven't, uh, all those catches and touchdowns and yards that you racked up have means nothing to us because none of them are in our record books. And right. so it's, it's time to go. Uh, was it to motivate him? Maybe, or maybe he was just answering the question honestly, which, which is why I like the, uh, the position coaches, um, presser so much because they're not used to having uh they're not used to being so pc or you know uh really watching the way they word things because it can it can produce a news cycle kind of like this did that uh you know i wouldn't say necessarily becomes a distraction for the team but it becomes another subject that you know now like if this happened during the year there'd be quarters going up to, you know, to Deshaun Jackson, asking about it, reporters going up to Mike Evans and then Jameis. And, you know, everybody on the offensive side of the ball is, you know, is there a rift between, you know, Deshaun Jackson and, mm-hmm. and, and, and Coach Munkin? Like, what's right. going on? Oh, my God. Don't forget, like, I, mean, I mean, don't forget, not only is Todd Munkin the offensive coordinator, he is also the wide receivers coach. So he is mm-hmm. Dexter Jackson's position coach. I yeah. Mean, they work yeah. hand in hand every day. So. Yeah, you know, and it'd be on like Good Morning Football, and it would just be this thing. So, uh, like I said, it's kind of the reason why I like watching these pressers because these coaches will tell you what they feel. But in the end of the day, you know, they're all grown ups. These guys have been battling, and uh, people, the top two percent of people that know how to play the sport of American football, their whole entire lives, and they've come out on top. So there's a, uh, I don't think there's much. Uh, room for uh, getting your feelings hurt, I guess. Um, if if you get your feelings hurt uh, and you're in the and you're in the NFL, I don't think you're gonna last that long. So uh, no harm, no foul. Who cares? Yeah, I I get the feeling that uh, either and just from watching it and even watching Dexter Jackson's response to it and everything that this is a conversation that that Todd Munkin and Dexter Jackson have either already had before. Or they've had something similar to it, you know, like, or there's some sort of understanding between them. And this was just Todd, like, kind of saying something that maybe they have already talked about. Like, I don't feel like it was a jab at Dexter Jackson, uh, Dexter Jackson, Deshaun Jackson. Um, I don't feel like it was a, a wagging his finger or laying down the law or anything like that. Like, I, I feel like Todd Munkin was just talking, you know, uh, he didn't mean anything disrespectful by it. I think it's, it's, it's probably just something that they've already, you know, um, that has already been brought up between the two of them at some point. I, I don't feel like it's any any big thing, and I think people are making too much, too much of a big deal out of it. And the only reason I'm talking about it now is because people made a big deal out of it, you know? Yeah. So, And it couldn't have been anything performance-based because when he said it, like, they hadn't done anything yet. I mean, right. they haven't even had OTAs yet. All the all the veterans did was just do weight training. They went out on the field. They did some running, you know, attached to chains, ran around in the sandbox and lifted weights. I mean, mm. there's nothing that Deshaun Jackson did that Todd Munkin can be like, oh, you're not working hard enough. They hadn't done anything yet. So right. obviously, you know, it, it's it's less than nothing. But, uh, you know, it was something to talk about. So we did. And and it's over. And there we go. 
So, all right. Uh, well, I've got one more thing that I want to talk about, Ren. Um, uh, there was a very fun uh, Twitter back and forth thing that happened uh, between the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, like their official social media guys, and the Atlanta Falcons, our division rival uh, social media guys. And, and at this point, everybody knows what we're talking about. Um, Bucks put something out about a fidget spinner, and then Falcons were like, oh, you're nervous about something, and they had a picture of, I don't know, who was it, Julio or someone? Um, uh, oh, their cornerback. Oh, God, what is his name? He's actually pretty good. Yeah, oh, no, he's a good player. That's right. Trufant, Trufant. Yeah, yeah, Desmond Trufant. Um, and then the Bucks went, no, not at all, and they tweeted a picture of Vernon Hargraves giving a high five to uh, uh, Jameis, uh, and their 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 numbers just happened to be twenty eight and three. You know, we all know that's the that's the Super Bowl score that um, the Falcons were up by and then wound up losing. Um, and, and first of all, let's just talk about that. What did you think about that little Twitter exchange between the Bucks and the Falcons? And and I would ask you to go back to when it happened and kind of in the immediate, like, what were you thinking then? Uh, what I was thinking then it. The tweet was so epic. I didn't get it at first. Like I just, I <laughs> didn't, I didn't get it. I, I, I saw it. I read it, and I was like, and actually, I was kind of like, uh, that's not, that's not a very good response. And and then after that, I, I was like, what the hell is Atlanta doing? And like on our on our Twitter feed, like like why <laughs> first, like why is Atlanta even caring about it? Oh, the spinners. Okay, that's funny. And then, but I didn't get it. But then when I started seeing it like pop up more and more in my timeline. Uh, it dawned on me. It was so subtle and epic that uh, I mean, it was it was perfect. It was it was one of those things that that it was just the perfect response to mm-hmm. you know just to like it was it was mic drop. It was total mic drop. It was yeah. just doom, okay, we're done. Uh, I thought it was hilarious. I thought it was great. But at the time, yeah, it was so subtle. Like I, I just you know I just like kind of I looked at it, slowed down a little bit, and just kind of scrolled right by it. But mm-hmm. in the end. Uh, you know, kudos, you know, <laughs> muy bueno, muy bueno, Buccaneers Twitter, uh, uh, well, well played. It was well played. It, it, that, that was the only thing that I thought, cause I got it immediately. As soon as I saw it, I went, oh no, oh, she's, oh, that's, that's fun. And the only thing that I could think that the Falcons would come back and be like, yeah, where were you when we were playing the Super Bowl? Like, that's the only response that I felt like the Falcons could have come back with, um, you know, or maybe posted a picture of a couch and saying, you know, the Bucks during the Super Bowl or something. Like that's the only way that they could have responded to that. Um, yeah. But even still, it it was like for what Twitter is and what that is as a is a medium and a platform. Um, now, and to me uh, personally, between the organizations, I didn't feel any major disrespect from that. It felt like friendly rival banter. If, if that makes sense. Like I, I didn't feel like it was that big of a deal. It was just, it was a great tweet. It was a great comeback. It was hilarious. It was funny. Um, it, it stung, you know, um, it was there. However, this also made news because there was one person in particular who did not appreciate the tweet so much. And that of course being head coach Dirk Cutter and everybody also knows this. He comes up to his very first press conference right after the first day of OTAs doesn't even let the press guys get a word out and says, Hey guys, first things first, I want to apologize for that tweet. Uh, he said it was, it was not professional. He said um, that it was not a good call on their part. He said, we don't have any room to be making fun of uh, anybody who is in the Super Bowl, whether they won or lost, because we want to be in the Super Bowl and we were sitting at home on the couch. And he said, that's not who our organization is. And that's not what we represent. Um, and that set off a firestorm of people. Um, yeah. Commenting on that back and forth because, because like the tweet that. was so epic. Like, like it was such a great tweet, but you know, cutter apologized for it. So, um, I'll actually jump in on this one first, just because I had my own thoughts on this and, and we tweeted out a, a few things from the Peter cast, um, Twitter account about this of just saying as a fan, I loved the Twitter banter. I thought it was great. I also understand where, where cutter is coming from. I really get what he's saying. And what I loved about cutter is, is, you know, for as much as people keep getting on this speak softly, carry a big stick. This is the speak softly side. I was just saying, hey, we don't have to go out there and, and beat our chest and hit a mic drop on people. 
we're going to go out and play. The big stick is, is we're going to beat you every single time. And that's what it's going to be. And we don't have to brag. We don't have to get into all of that. And if that's what he's trying to build, if that's the culture that he's trying to build around one buck, I am for it. I'm all for it. I still love the tweet. I thought it was hilarious. I thought it was amazing. It was great on their part. Um, one of those situations where I really hope whoever's in the social media office would just prefer to ask for forgiveness rather than permission because it was so amazing. But I also get Cutter's side of it. I would I fully go that far. I don't know that I don't know that Cutter fully understands what Twitter is or what Twitter is about, um, and and the way that banter can happen there. Um, and so I I just don't know. What are your thoughts on the whole Cutter apologizing for it kind of thing? When he first did it, I was upset, you know, just like everybody else, like, oh, you know, it's it's like, hey, guess what? You get to open your Christmas presents on Christmas Eve. Yay. Oh, wait, no, I changed my mind. Oh, it was just like that. Like, <laughs> you're taking this away from me. No. Uh, and but, oddly, oddly, I think many fans, myself maybe included, responded just like my five year old would if you'd done that to him. Yeah, and that's what it was, because right? it was just like why are you doing this to us? It's like, it's like we have the roster, we have the quarterback, we have the coaches, we have the GM. It's like, this is it. It's the start of the golden age of buck and fandom. And, and you know, we get to beat our chest and talk crap finally, you know, and we were on par with, with, with the elite teams in the league. Maybe, uh, <laughs> have yet to prove it yet, <laughs> but then yeah. like halfway through him, 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 uh, him, dirt cutter, uh, during his opening statement at the press conference, I I was I was back on his side. I mean, I get it. Uh, the Bucks don't want to be that type of organization, um, uh, but I also agree that. Let me say this: I think it was a group effort from the Buccaneers uh, staff, uh, probably mostly from the front office, that came to this decision and to. Uh, deal with it this way and they pass it on to Dirk uh who was probably who I think was in you know there in the room when this decision was made mm-hmm. and they left it up to Dirk to make the statement um I don't think this was Dirk Cutter only and I could be wrong but I don't think this is Dirk Cutter only uh you know like he's walking down the halls because he's not on Twitter and like you said he doesn't really understand the dynamics of Twitter and Honestly, that's kind of like the best part of Twitter is, is, right. is for for things like that. I mean, that is what, you know, that's Twitter. Uh, you know, that's the fun part about Twitter. So <clears throat> I get it. Um, but, uh, yeah, so like I was saying, uh, that's the way they want to go. That's fine. Um, uh, I'll back them up on that. I would have backed them up either way. If it went a, lot of, a little too far – uh, if I felt it went a little too far, I would have said so. But like I said, it was just, it was the perfect, it was the perfect tweet for, I mean, I haven't seen a tweet that perfect and I'm going to get off football for a second and I'm not sure. Are you a lightning fan by any chance there, Brent? I am a lightning, lightning fan because I'm a Tampa Bay fan and I have zero other loyalties to any hockey team. So yes, I will, I would qualify myself. I, I'm not a lightning fan. I would say I'm a lightning, uh, supporter. If that makes there sense, like I, I want yeah. to see them win. I'm not really following their season. You're I'd love to go to a, a game. Jersey. I I might if they had one my size. You know, <laughs> I'm, um, I'm sure they have a hockey sweater your size. Yeah, I'd probably go to a game. Just give me one without the pads. Like you know, it should fit. Um, but uh, I, I you know I I'd, I'd gladly go to a game. I'm it would. I don't understand the sport of hockey enough to get into it. Uh, but right. maybe if I started understanding the sport, I'd be more into it. And uh, I will say this. I do love the fact uh, I was living in Tampa at the time. The Tampa Bay Lightning won the Stanley Cup. Is that their big oh, thing? Are you serious? That They won the Stanley Cup. <laughs> but the year that they did it was the year that they beat like Calgary or like some Canadian team. Like, you know, the guys who should win it every single year, the guys who live in, you know, 180 degree weather in Florida. We're the ones who beat them in ice hockey. Uh, I loved that little thing, but uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, I like the lightning. I'm for them. Okay. Well, <laughs> long answer to a really simple question. Sorry. <laughs> so uh, there was a saying, uh, we had a really good goalie named Ben Bishop. Uh, and like there was a saying, there was t-shirts and everything uh, playing off the, 
off the phrase, uh, you know, I'm going to say it, bitch, please, it would be bish, please. So B-I-S-H, please, as in like he stops everything, like you try to shoot on bish, please, like you can't get by me. Okay. Well, one night he got his front two teeth knocked out with a puck, I believe. It could have been a puck, skate, stick, whatever. But it got knocked out and someone tweeted out bish, please. And that was just, <laughs> yeah. And since that tweet, that's the best tweet I've seen <laughs> since then. <laughs> so... I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I know. No, like when I saw that, I was like, I was like, you win. Like, like, like you won the Twitter. internet today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Twitter is closed for the night. Good night. Bye. Like, that's it. It's a done. It's a wrap. Perfect tweet. Like, and I haven't seen a tweet that perfect. You know, uh, that's the next tweet I've seen that that was that perfect since that one. So uh, that's how I feel about it. I, and, and like, it's just to re put a kind of put a button on this thing. Um, I understand what Kurt Cutter is saying, that that's what they want to do. That's how they want to do it. Uh, I agree with that. Uh, but ooh, it was such a good epic tweet, and uh, and I liked it. But I, I'm with you. I'm with you, Coach. Yeah, I yeah, I'm I'm with him. I I'm I loved the tweet. I'm going to go on record saying I loved the tweet. Uh, I thought it was great. It made me laugh. Um, still up, as far as I know. It it, yeah, yeah. They've they've not deleted it. Um, but I, you know, I can go to that whole point because there, there is the point and it's, it's a really good point as, as excited as we are about this season and we don't need to pump brakes. I'm not saying that the fact is we haven't done anything yet. Like, <laughs> like we've put a lot of stuff, like a lot of, you know, a lot of groceries in the pantry as someone else likes to say, or, you know, we've stocked the kitchen or we've, we, we, I mean, it looks great. We've had non-contact OTAs and some weightlifting. That's all we've done. We've not actually put it on the field yet. And until the until the lights turn on and the the scoreboard is on and it's actually counting, uh, and I'm not talking preseason. I'm talking actually in the season. Uh, that's that's where we really need to save it. So not saying pump the brakes at all. Get excited. Stay excited. You know, go all out, Bucks fans. But uh, I get where Cutter's coming from and. Uh, you know, I, I'm not going to apologize for it, but uh, I get where he's coming from. That's all. So, uh, well, Ren, uh, with that, that's that's all the headlines that I had. Did you have any uh, maybe that we didn't hit on that you wanted to cover real quick before we get out of here? Well, uh, do you want to talk about Doug Martin's press conference or no? Doug Martin. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's talk about that. That was that was kind of something you, you had brought up. Go ahead. Go for it. Yeah, well, it was the first time Doug Martin had talked to the press. He'd sent out like, you know, one tweet, you know, maybe since his suspension for PEDs. Uh, first time he talked to the press, uh, a lot of people, including myself, were sort of shocked that he did it. Um, you would hear a lot of people on Twitter and, and other Buccaneer podcasts were thinking that every time the question would come up, like, when do you think, you know, Doug Martin's going to come to the podium? And everyone's like, he's not, he's not going, like, he's not going to be up there. Like, uh, you know, no way. And then lo and behold, like a couple of days later, there he is. And so I, I applaud the bucks for doing it. I think they had to eventually, uh, especially before higher Knox got there. Um, so, uh, you know, it was, it was a nice presser. Uh, I feel honestly that the press core, I guess we can call it the beat writers kind of let me down a bit. Um, and mainly it's because no one asked him if he wanted, like, this is his perfect opportunity, talking to the press, talking to the fans, and no one asked him uh, if he wanted to issue some sort of apology to the fans for, you know, not being available, even though it was a team decision, uh, not being available for the Saints game um, when after the season, at the end of that season, and how all the other records played out, that if we would have won that game, uh, we would have made the playoffs and Doug Martin wasn't available. Now, you know, I don't have a crystal ball. If Doug Martin played the game, you know, maybe he, we don't win. Uh, there's a very strong argument that Joe Quiz Rogers was actually playing better at the position than Doug Martin was. But the point was when his team needed him most, uh, he wasn't there and no one really asked him about that. So I kind of, I was like, I was like, eh, I, I felt like they, they, they kind of kid gloved him a little too much for my taste. Uh, not that I, you know, I want him to go out head hunting or anything. I'm glad he's back. I hope he has a great year. Uh, for most, uh, uh, 
first and foremost, I hope that, you know, that that part of his life is behind him and it never rears its ugly head again. Mm -hmm. Uh, then all the other fandom things come in, come into it. But, uh, and also, uh, they didn't really ask too much about his contract. Like, uh, has he had talked to the Bucks about, you know, renegotiating his contract? You know, uh, have you and your agent had talks, you know, sign of like in the ballpark, like where you will re-sign with the Bucks? Have the Bucks told you that that you're going to have to renegotiate uh, to be able to play for them week four? Uh, it was a lot of about how he's feeling, how he's doing, um, which are, you know, I wanted to know, too. But but the questions that really surround me as a Bucks fan uh, where I wanted to, I wanted to hear you. I wanted to hear him say, basically, you know, selfishly, maybe I'm sorry. And then two, like, what's going on with your contract? Because that's the million dollar question with Doug Martin. Mm -hmm. You know, are the Bucks really going to pay him seven million dollars uh, prorated uh, after they gave him this huge contract? And he, you know, he kind of, you know, left them and us hanging out to dry at the end of the season, the beginning of this season. So. A little too much kick gloves for me. I, th I think the press let us down a bit. No, I think they do a great job. Uh, I like a lot of their personalities that are on the Bucks, the uh, the Bucks uh, beat reporters. So I'm not like you know calling out the media and going you know terrible job. It was just uh, something I think w w I would like to see pursue a little further. That's all. Yeah, I, I think you and I might be on a little bit of uh, opposite ends of the spectrum on this one because um, I, I I remember watching that presser and. Um, with it, first of all, I, I, I might amend the apology thing because uh, I certainly get where you're coming from on that. Um, you could make the argument that Doug Martin really wasn't with us the whole season last year, uh, not just for those last two games. Um, you know that that there was a bit of a letdown the whole season long. Um, you know, certainly, certainly, if this issue had been something, you know, was something that tracked through the whole season, um, you know, it just came to a head there at the very end, uh, and we'll we'll have effects in through the first three weeks of this season. Um, but really for the whole season, cause that, you know, had we won any of the other games, we would have been in the playoffs, right? Uh, the team needed him the whole season, not just there at the end. Um, so, you know, maybe to amend the apology really for the whole season. Um, and, and I certainly get where that, where that would be coming from. I, I don't remember if Doug has issued an apology for that yet or not. I, I don't remember like when he first issued his statement uh, last year when he was going into treatment uh, or if anything coming out. I, I just don't know. I don't remember. So uh, if somebody out there knows, please let me know. Um, but the other thing is it is I, I want to say it was Roy Cummings. I could be wrong. Um, Roy Cummings was kind of, I think it was Roy who was over uh, Doug's uh, right shoulder and, um, you know, when the media, what I will say this for the media to give them a little bit of credit, they did kind of broach those topics with Doug during his press conference, but Doug was very quick to shut them down. Like he was not answering those questions. Um, and, and even when, when Doug kind of shut them down, it did seem like Roy was, he kind of kept coming back to it a little bit to see if he could get something more. Um, but Doug kept shutting him down. And, and I actually thought the press handled, that like I think they took the clue or, or the cue really well from Martin of saying, "Hey, this is not a, this is still an off limits topic right now." Um, I do hope that those that, that those things come out later because I, I have said this before. I would, I think people uh, there's there is there is strength in your story to be able to tell your story and and it can help other people by telling your story. And I'd love to hear Doug Martin. Um, get on a spot where he is telling his story, not because I'm curious of all the, all the weird details. That's not it at all. It's uh, I, because I think he can probably help other people who are in that situation. Um, but, uh, you know, for whatever reason, that still seems like it's kind of an off limits topic for him. Um, so I, I liked the fact that, that they kind of let that go. However, I do, I do agree with you. I, the questions still linger of what are, what are they going to do with his contract? And maybe Doug doesn't even really know. You know, um, cause I, I remember they did ask him something about it and he said, I don't know. That's between my agent and them, um, or something of that effect. So, uh, but you know, if Doug still gets in front of the press, I think we could continue to, I think we probably could expect the media to continue to kind of go back to some of these topics until those questions get answered. And I think on some level, I think it would be fair for them to do it. Um, you know, and, and I'd love to see that open up. Rebuttal. 
<laughs> even though I, I i don't disagree with anything you've said and and uh i this is sort of this whole topic is sort of nitpicking mm-hmm. uh but it's just something that i would have liked to have seen and i want to talk about it yeah uh as far as not having doug martin there though you know the whole season and you know there was plenty of games you could have won and and this and that but let's face it you always remember the last one that counted you know uh no one cares about what happened in the rams game except when dirt cutter let the clock run down and Jameis overthrew and we ran out of time that's what they care about you know uh no one really cares about uh you know we should have won these not really any games in the second half except mm-hmm. for the saints game maybe uh you know the raiders game you know yeah, that one slipped away from us too, as well, because of a dumb penalty. Uh, so that's what I would argue about the Saints. That's the one you kind of remember. Mm-hmm. You know, in any game, you can always say there's lots of opportunities. It wasn't just one or loss on that on that last play, but yeah, it was one or loss in that last play. You made the kick or you didn't. That's that was the deciding factor. Right. Uh, so you know, that's really no here, no there. And to talk about. Uh, how Doug was kind of uh, he was he was short and it was Roy Cummings uh, I'm going to back you up on that and he was short because he asked him about his rehab and he basically said like long enough and and uh, and yeah he he was giving out the vibe that you know I don't want to talk about that and I don't want to talk about that and I understand that and I can understand respecting someone but uh, to all due respect to Doug Martin uh, he doesn't get to decide what questions he doesn't want to be asked or not to be asked Mm -hmm. you know that's that's like that's rule number one of freedom of the press it's like it's like uh, it doesn't matter how doug martin feels or not feels he can he can not answer it if he doesn't want to Mm -hmm. but he doesn't get to sort of maneuver manipulate the press into asking what questions they can and cannot do and if the press feels like they they want to ask that question but afraid they're going to hurt doug martin's feelings or you know, maybe they won't get an interview with Doug Martin later. Well, I guess you could take that into concern and, and weigh it up and down. But honestly, if, if, if that's, I don't know, I'm just, I guess I'm just more of a, <laughs> I guess in my head, I dream of, uh, of like a more hard nosed journalist. And in the end, it's just a sports team, you know, mm-hmm. that we all know and love and live and die with. Who cares well, about that? Here's the deal. <laughs> let's, let's just send Tom Jones over there and he can, uh, he can drill Doug Martin all day long. Uh, <laughs> for that. I don't have a problem with Tom Jones. <laughs> Why does everyone hate that guy? I oh, would, we can we, get into that, we, but we're not. Should going we do, to. do? Should we do a Tom Jones? No. Here's what I think. No. 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 All right. Go ahead. No. Do it. No. Say it. Say no, it. Now quickly. you said it. You brought it up. Now you got to say it. And this is our podcast. So go for it. <laughs> this is what I think of Tom Jones. This is a story I have. He's just a strange cat. He just. <laughs> he's just. That's just who he is. Like he just. uh just I think yesterday he came out. And I know you're not a Lightning fan, but uh, the best, arguably the best player on the team, the young kid named Jonathan Druin, who's had some ups and downs, but had a very good year this year, especially after Steam Tankos, the real star player, got hurt. Uh, he came out with an article yesterday saying the Lightning should trade him or reasons why Lightning should trade him. Of course, you know, Twitter, ah, I'm on top down, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. But that's just who he is. And I fully believe that he believes what he, he believes 100 percent in what he writes. And here's a story that backs up my point. He used to have a morning show along with Rick Stroud on the local radio station down here, 620 DAE. They used to do the six to nine slot. I actually used to wake up two hours before I had to to listen to it because it was my favorite show of their whole docket. They went from like basically 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. roughly depending on when baseball broke in. Uh, but those are the guys I like. They're both reporters. They're both like feet on the ground. You know, they're at one buck. They're at, you know, Amelie arena. That's where the lightning play, you know, they are there and they're used to crafting a story and, uh, thinking about what they say before they say it. So they have this great idea, 620, And I thought, it, and I think it is a great idea. Uh, they were going to have all their guys on a stage, basically, uh, a, ra- a round table, uh, of of all the of all like 
Tom Jones and Rick Stroud show, then the show after that, show after that, show after that. So there was four shows up there. Some guys have two, some guys have one, and they're going to have it at the state fairgrounds. And they they pimped it for like a month. Like, come out to the state fairgrounds, it's going to be in the Budweiser tent, sit down, we're going to have special guest speakers that ask questions to these guys, and it's going to be like a back and forth with all these you know sports talk personalities all around, and it's going to be great. <clears throat> first question, first, first question. It was about the Rays. This was back when the Rays were uh, having serious uh, – they're having serious problems at the city of St. Petersburg at the stadium, Hillsborough County, Pinellas County. And there was a lot of talk about the Rays moving uh, to Canada, to Montreal. First question was about the Rays. I don't remember how it was worded or what it said. First person to speak up. First question, tent full of people, beer flowing, outside, hot day. Tom Jones goes, I think the Rays are moving to Montreal. That's how he opened. Uh, boo, boo. <laughs> he just doesn't. That's just how he is. Instead of saying, I know this is going to be an unpopular opinion, uh, but please hear me out. This is I, I have some points to back this up. So just give me a chance. And, uh, and I know that you're probably not going to like it, but I think the Rays are going to move to Montreal. Now that might got some boos, but they'd quiet down and they'd listen to him because he prefaced it with like, hey, but that's not who Tom Jones is. Tom Jones is the moving to Montreal. And that's just, that's it. You know, Jameis hates women or whatever he said in that article. Or <laughs> Quan Alexander can't play football. Or Jonathan Duran needs to be traded. And that's just who he is. And just get used to it or you're just going to end up pulling all your hair out. Uh, that's, that's, that's just how, that's, that's how it goes. Well, there you go. I, I have an opinion on Tom Jones. And I think it's it's real simple. It's real simple. I don't think he's a fan at all. Like, like, you know, we've heard he's not supposed to be. Well, okay. That's, they say that, that that's all what they say. I, but I think when you listen to Greg Allman, well, first of all, when Greg Allman talks about the bucks, very rarely does he give opinions. He really, he really does report the way a journalist should report. Tom Jones gives a lot of opinions and he's a and, columnist and that's the, right. Uh, there you go. And that's the difference between those two. But Tom Jones I- I- is not a fan. When you listen to like Mark Cook, uh, Scott Reynolds, even Greg Allman and, and these guys who talk about how, you know, in this job, it kind of takes the fandom away from you. You really have to separate yourself as a fan in order to be a reporter and all that. Do you still get this feeling like there's this underlying they still really kind of are fans. Like even yeah, if they deny I, it, you get this feeling that underneath they really, they're really still there. I don't think so that's think true Rick for Tom Stroud Jones. And Greg Allman want the bucks to win. Yes, I do. Yeah, exactly. It, do, does Tom Jones, I don't think he gives flying rip, you know, I really don't, you know, <laughs> maybe, Steelers fan. Uh, yeah, I, I just, I, sure. Uh, <laughs> but I, I think that's it. I think that's the big difference. So Tom Jones can go out there and he can say things like, uh, you know, everybody should pump the brakes and okay, let's, his point is valid of the bugs haven't done anything yet. Let's see who they've got. They've still got some major holes. They've still got some question marks. Da, 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 da. Quan Alexander can play a bit. Da, 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 da. You know, and, and we as fans take offense to that. And, and maybe rightly so. Or he goes out and writes, I'm not going to call it a hit piece. I'm just going to call it shoddy journalism on the whole thing with, uh, with Jameis, you know, and, and at the school. Like, he wrote something up without all the facts being included in there and, and put out something that I – yeah, I'm not even gonna get started on that. Um, <laughs> but I just, I would call that shoddy journalism, and and that's just my opinion. And and you know, but I'm not I'm not gonna go out and scream death to Tom Jones or f Tom Jones. I, no, I I don't I don't have any hatred towards the guy. Uh, I'm just always gonna look at his articles with a with a sideways view. You know, um, <laughs> it, it, so you Eyes know, half closed. Clicked yeah. On it. And and I'm just gonna realize this guy's not really a fan, so you know, take it for what it's worth, and you know, whatever. So let's get off of that. Hey, <laughs> Bucks fans, we're gonna turn this thought, this this conversation back to you, and we'd like to know your thoughts on our thoughts. You want to talk about Tom Jones? Go for it. How about Doug Martin, uh, Dex, uh, Dexter Jackson, Deshaun Jackson, uh, Roberto Aguayo, Dirk Cutter making an apology. The Bucks Twitter. What do you think? You can let us know by shooting us an email to thepewtercast at gmail.com, or you can find us on Twitter at thepewtercast or on facebook.com forward slash thepewtercast. We do respond to all forms of feedback, so keep that coming in. Well, guys, coming up next, it's going to be time for our top three segments, so stay tuned. We'll be right back. 
does a bastard, orphan, son of a whore and a Scotsman, dropped in the middle of a forgotten spot in the Caribbean by providence, impoverished and squalor, grow up to be a hero and a scholar. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. Right now, for you, the PewterCast fans, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. This summer, I'm reading the book Alexander Hamilton by Ron Chernow. This is the book off of which Lin-Manuel Miranda has based his hit Broadway musical, Hamilton. In the book, Chernow tells us the engaging story of a relatively unknown founding father, who was key to just about every important event in the founding of the United States of America. And by the way, he was someone who made friends and enemies at just about every single turn. It's not hard to understand why Miranda was inspired to use hip-hop as the art form to convey Hamilton's story to the stage. To download Alexander Hamilton or any one of Audible's 180,000 titles that you can choose from, just go to audibletrial.com forward slash the pewtercast. Again, that's audibletrial.com forward slash the pewtercast for your free audio book. Died for him. Me, I trusted him. Me, I loved him. And me, I'm the damn fool that shot him. There's a million things I haven't done just to pay. What's your name, man? Alexander Hamilton. Welcome back to the Pewter Cast. This is episode 36, phase two begins. Uh, this week for our top three, uh, we th- there has been lots of information that's been coming out of one buck. And one of the, the chunks of information came from a group of people that we haven't really, uh, well, we never really get a chance to talk to these guys, at least not very often. And that's from our, from our position coaches. And so we thought we'd take a look this week at uh, what are some of the top three insights that we got from our position coaches from their press conferences. Um, what was that early last week? I think it was Ren, or, or maybe earlier, uh, later part of, of the week before, whatever it was, sometime between the last two episodes um, for when those come. So, Ren, uh, I'll go ahead and start with you, man. Uh, did you have any criteria for what might have floated to the top or, you know, uh, whatever, your number three thing you got from position coaches? Criteria was pretty much something that raised an eyebrow, uh, something that asked a, that answered a question that I or I've seen uh, fans on Twitter ask about or, or talk about uh, was pretty much my criteria. And I have – narrowing these down to three is is really going to be hard. Um, uh, I'm going to probably pull a lot of them from uh, George Warhop, the offensive line coach. That guy's the press conference was, was like a quote machine. That would not um, be a bad thing. Just for the record, his is the one that I have the most notes from personally. So go ahead. Yeah, me too. Like he, he had stuff all over the place. Uh, but I'm going to start with number three was something that I found that was really interesting. Um, obviously, so talking about it uh, was that, that if a tackle goes down, Dot or uh, Donovan Smith, that Kevin Pamphy, I'm still saying that. I'm, I'm going to stick with Pamphy. <laughs> so I can correct it. Kevin Kevon Pamphy, uh, Kevin Pamphy. Uh, is going to be the backup tackle. So that means if Dot goes down like he did last year, then Kevin's going to bounce out and they're going to put somebody else into uh, his guard spot. So there'll be two position changes if a tackle goes down, which I thought was really interesting as in. So what that tells me, one, obviously he's the best tackle, you know, third best tackle on the team. And two, that uh, the Bucks probably really it's a contract year for him the bucks really gonna probably want to sign him and he's going to be sort of the heir apparent uh uh when demir dotson uh you know if, if he doesn't take it over before that but when demir dotson moves on it looks like kevin panfill is, is slated in is being groomed for the uh, right tackle spot yeah, I, I had that one down as a note as well. Um, which honestly, once I started thinking about thinking about it, I kind of went, "Well, of course that's who it would be," you know. Um, 
or at least I would think that's who it would be. But, you know, we did see him. They brought in Leonard Wester, I think, once last year. Uh, Caleb Beninock is certainly, I think he he slotted in as a guard. Um, you know, and, and Coach Warhop mentioned that all of these guys are training up and down the line, like they're cross-training across the entire line. Uh, but to just kind of clarify, um, and as far as, you know, that position coach is concerned, if a tackle goes down, it is Kevin Pamphill. He's first up uh, or next man up. Um, you know, it, it's it's we definitely like that. I mean, seeing Kevin Pamphill, I, how many games did he start last year? Was it like 14? I think it was. I think he missed a couple just due to injury or something. Um, you know, when you have I cannot guy, confirm or deny. Yeah, I, it was somewhere around there. I mean, it, he started the vast majority of the games last year and played and played through the whole, you know, through the whole season mostly. Um you know, when you have a guy who's taking steps into that, uh, you don't want him to take steps backwards. So to to put him into kind of that that spot, because let's face it, uh, Demar Dotson could go down at any point in the season. You know, he he is certainly not a spring chicken. I mean, any of these guys could go down at any point, but you know, uh, just just based on age and body, you know, Demar uh, Demar looks like he might be the next guy. Um, you know, that we could see go down with something, oh, maybe Sweezy, I don't know. But as far as tackles go between the two, it'd probably be DeMar. Um, so just to clarify that. So, yeah, I had that down certainly as a note uh, just just for really good clarity on that whole deal. So uh, good good insight there, good insight. Uh, for mine, uh, criteria really was – Real quick. Yeah, go ahead. Real quick, I, ch- I checked that and you're correct, 14 games. 14, 14 games really? started. Yeah, and I just pulled that out of the air. See, I totally screw up how many kicks Roberto Aguayo and Nick Folk make, but I can get that right. Well, you're Aguayo biased. <laughs> I'm not. You I are am. too. I am. I, you know, I it's, it's. I hope it's, he wins a job too. I just don't think he is. It, it, right. It's 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 just a like like I'm the guy I'm the guy people love playing poker with because I will totally get myself pot committed even when it's stupid. Like when I should absolutely <laughs> fold, I will keep playing because no, damn it. I'm committed to this hand, this pair of twos. Uh, <laughs> so uh, nobody play poker with me. Um, so uh, as far as criteria for me, uh, it was it was really kind of the same thing that you had of, you know, what 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 made the hair on the back of my neck stand up when I was, you know, when I was listening to it. Um, I also tried to kind of stay away from the things that became big headlines or things that everybody else jumped on. Um, but I didn't, I didn't hold myself to that, but I, I tended to shy away from that. Um, and, and by the way, I'm just going to go ahead and say these, I can't order these three. I can't say, uh, this one won, and then this one stuck out more and this one stuck out the most. I, I can't do that for this list. So I'm just going to name three in no particular order. So my number three, uh, pick, um, is actually going to come from Nate, uh, Kazar. I I don't know how you say his last name. Uh, Kaxor. Nate Kaxor, uh, he's our special teams coordinator. Um, where uh, speaking of Roberto Aguayo, uh, you know he had just in in a kind of enlightened last year a little bit. He said, "Listen, when you're in the middle of a season, you don't want to mess with somebody's mechanics. So whatever whatever Roberto did not get figured out uh, preseason last year." Like they just let him run with that through the whole year. Like you can keep working on their mental state the whole time through, but the the mechanics of how they're doing it that's something you really reserve for the off season. Um, just from a coaching standpoint, I've never heard of that before, uh, and I thought that was real interesting. Um, you know, kind of like a here's how we do this, and one of the things you don't do in the middle of the season is is mess with their mechanics because you're going to screw them all up. So, uh, to me, it that was more of an interesting thing than it was. Uh, uh, you know, blow the lid off of something, but I do feel like it kind of explained a lot last year, and I'm I'm interested to see what mechanics may have changed for Roberto here in the off season. I think that's a bunch of crap. I think that answer is just garbage. I really do. Uh, baseball pitchers change their mechanics during the season. Arm slot hitters. Uh, that's all they do. Like like that's all they. They practice during the week as mechanics. You don't think what you think that uh, Donovan Smith, like whatever he tries to work on during training camp, they don't work on it for the rest of the year. His footwork or, 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 you know, getting, you know, getting himself his weight centered over his body or backdrops on cornerbacks. I think he just doesn't know. And there's not really anybody out there. And I've done some research on it. I don't think there's anybody. There's no kicking guru. 
there's no NFL kicking guru, college kicking guru. There's no there's no swing coach type of deal. Mm-hmm. So I think that's just kind of like a bullcrap excuse. It's just something that you say like, oh, you don't want to mess with his head. It's like, come on, man. Well, what, then why then why practice? You know, if you, why does why does anybody practice in any sport? If you're not trying to improve your mechanics and, and improve, like shave seconds off your time, or you know, w- 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 then why do it? So I, I don't. Uh, uh, that raised an eyebrow for me too. I didn't put it down, mm-hmm. but I just I think I don't think that was uh, I think that was a terrible answer, and I don't mm-hmm. buy it for one second. And that that there may have been why it raised such an eyebrow for me because I went, huh. That just seems really whatever, and I'm not a kicking coach. However, as you just put up, as you just said, there's apparently no kicking guru out there. So, uh, hey, for any of our young listeners who may be looking for a job in the NFL, (laughs) become a kicking guru. Apparently, there's a need that could be filled. So so with that, Ren, uh, what what else stuck out to you? Your number two. Uh, I'm going to go back to uh, George Warhop again. he said it almost like at the beginning of his interview, uh, there was big speculation this off season about uh, Allie moving to center. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, some people thought it was a terrible idea because why mess with a, you know, possibly a Pro Bowl guard? Um, but uh, George Wapp said he said he told Allie he's like, uh, eventually you're going to center no matter what. You know, it's just a question of when. And he said that almost like off the bat was like one of the because one of the first questions about Allie moving to center. So the Buccaneers had had plans that Allie was moving to center, just like Jason Sight said when he drafted him at the podium. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, think he can be a good NFL center. And it was just a question of when and all the stars align. And now he's moved to center. So for all the the hubbub back and forth about if he should go, shouldn't go, don't mess with it. Uh, it's been in their plan since since they since before they drafted him. Or, or, you know, thinking that if we get this guy, this is our plan with him. And they got him, and it's been the plan, and now it's coming to fruition. So I thought that was interesting that uh, it was kind of put the stamp on it, the period that, yes, you know, it's been speculated. But, yes, this has always been the plan for Ali Marpet, and now he's there. Yeah, that was also a note that I had written down as well. Um, and I found that real interesting. Um, I, I think it, it – I don't – for for whatever reason, I don't know why I've always been skeptical of the idea of Ali moving to center. I'm really okay with it now, um, and I have been for quite a while, and I don't think whether I'm okay with it or not really matters to the Buccaneers. But, um, you know, it, it's I, I can't explain why it's just it's never sat super easy with me. Um, but this kind of fixes all of that for me a little bit. Like, they've always looked at him – as that as a potential replacement as a center or as a potential new center um and i'd like i'm now curious like i'd love to sit and talk with coach warhop like if i could just buy him a beer and talk with him of like what were you seeing like what what was tipping you off to that like you know things that he might not be able to actually say in front of the press like just between him and i um i'd love to know what those are because as as he was saying that, you know, and we talked about, you know, Warhop loves to cross train his guys all up and down the line. But I do remember even from his rookie year, Allie had been um, taking snaps as center during practice and stuff uh, quite a bit. Like he was being cross trained as a center. So, um, you know, if this is a, a it was he was saying it was just a matter of when, not if when it would happen. And, and now it's there. So, uh, of course, we've all seen the picture of Ali Marpet where it, it's like he alone as center with his hand on the ball, facing the entire four man front of our defensive line. Um, <laughs> that was a good shot. It was a great shot. And, you know, it's, it's, you know, that's what we want. That's absolutely what we want with Allie. So, um, yeah, good stuff on that. Uh, Thanks. For my number two, I'm actually going to stay right here in the realm of the offensive line with Coach Warhop. Um, and, and, I'm I'm actually going to say I kind of hope this person becomes Ali Marpet. I really do, and I think it could. Um, but it was kind of towards the end of his press conference. He was saying that that no – I think he was actually talking about J.R. Sweezy, uh, having Sweezy back. Um, but what he was saying was last year no one really had the meanness that Logan Mankins had had. You actually referenced this actually I think earlier in the episode tonight. Um, uh-huh. that, that no one really had that – that tenacity, that meanness that that uh, Logan Mankins had, and J.R. Sweezy is kind of bringing that in 
a little bit. And I found that real interesting because we've often talked about Joe Hawley and how how nasty he can be and how in the you know in the fight and in the scrum he could be to say that that even Joe Hawley for as much as we've heard about that with him doesn't actually quite measure up to to the level of of viciousness so to speak I guess that Logan Mankins was uh I just found that real interesting and like I said I'd love to kind of see Ali take on that role uh cuz certainly you know we anticipate Ali being with us a lot longer than say even J.R. Sweezy is going to be around. So, uh, and certainly maybe even Joe Holly, like, uh, you know, we just, he's a young guy. He's going to be with us quite a while. So, uh, you know, I'd love to see that become Ali if, if that's, if that's him, if that's in his wheelhouse. But, uh, I don't know. I found that real interesting for him to say that, that no one else has really had that. And, you know, it seems like J.R. Sweezy is bringing that back in. Yeah, that was interesting. Uh, I believe the quote was, uh, beat the dog crap out of you edge, the edge that Sweezy brings. Uh, I have that down as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah, it was a little surprising and kind of like, you know, as a fan, a little hurtful. I mean, you know, sometimes the truth (laughs) hurts. But, you know, you're kind of like, you you know, you want your offensive line to have that edge and that tough nastiness and, you know, just, uh, you know, ground the defensive tackles and defensive linemen into the dirt. And uh, I guess it was missing. I mean, they know I don't. But uh, but like you said, yeah, I'm glad it's back. I'm I'm, I'm glad that uh, somebody's leading that charge. Uh, so yeah, I, like I said, I have I have that quote down too. Um, I could go with another George Warhop, but I'm gonna move on. <laughs> uh, Sorry, I, honorable it, mentions are coming up. So yeah, yeah, I got a bunch of them. I'll probably skip some because uh, time. <laughs> Uh, Brett Maxey, the defensive backs coach. Uh, the Bucks are a little different. They have Brent Maxey as a defensive back coach and John Hoke, the secondary coach. But uh, if you start to read between the lines, Brett Maxey is more the safeties coach and uh, John Hoke is more of the cornerbacks coach. They both they both coach both players, but it seems that like if the safeties were going to huddle up and the cornerbacks were going to huddle up separately, that Maxi would be in the safety, uh, you know, teaching in the safety huddle. So this is what he said. We've talked a lot about, you know, free safety, strong safety. I know when we had a, uh, Riley Almond on, I asked him like, you know, like what's the difference between free safety and strong safety? And he went over it for us and basically, uh, <clears throat> you know, one plays on the tight end side of the field and one doesn't. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Uh, but in Mike Smith's defense, you always hear that uh, the safeties are interchangeable. They have to play both positions. And he kind of gave the reason why. Uh, and you see this a lot in the NFL. It's like they come up to the line of scrimmage and the tight end's on one side. And, you know, everyone looks around and, and the defense sets up and quarterback, you know, calls that a signal. And the tight end gets out of his stance and runs the other side of the line of scrimmage. And so instead of the safety switching, you know, uh, for someone that would be just a free safety that would, that would switch with the tight end, the bucks stay, uh, on their half, the the safety stays on their half of the field. And basically the reason they're doing this because they don't want to tip their hand or show anything about what kind of coverage they're running. So that's the reason why, uh, you have to be able to play both, uh, free and strong and Mike Smith's defense, because it's more of a, uh, coverage and coverage as in uh um they're covering up their card they're, they're trying to show as least amount as possible to the quarterback uh at the line of scrimmage pre-snap and i think it's a really smart idea i just i never really i always heard that that the safeties have to play both but i never knew really why or or how that happened uh so but uh yeah he cleared up for us so that that's pretty much it that's why they uh have to play both because they don't want them to switch when the tight end moves hmm Fun. I actually I didn't get to his press conference. Um, I I ran out of time and and stuff with children and things. Um, so yeah, no, that's interesting. I see, and that's what I'm saying. I love those little like those insights into like here's why you do it. Like here's the the coaching thing, and you know, I, you know, I'll go back to the one I said earlier about the mechanics. You know, even if that's complete BS, um, at least to get an insight into their mindset. You know, uh, this one seems a little bit more. This one doesn't doesn't make me go BS more than I think the other one um, kind of kind of possibly does. But uh, yeah, no, I like it. I, I like those little kinds of insights into it uh, for my number one. Um, again, not really a number one. It's just 
A1. Um, but I did like this this quote a lot. And this one comes from uh, Todd Munkin, our, our wide receivers coach and our offensive coordinator. Um, and this has less to do with coaching and this has less to do with uh, anything else. It just it, it's a good state of mind to have. And we've kind of talked about it a little bit already with the whole dirt cutter thing earlier. But his quote was, and I wrote it down. He said, talent alone gets you beat. It's execution that wins you games. Um, that's such a great quote. Like, like as a, as a steward, as, as a student of leadership, uh, like I'm going to take that and I want to use that. Uh, cause you can have all the talent in the world. That's going to get you beat. You actually have to go out and, and execute. You have to get it done. You have to put it on the field. You actually have to make it happen. Um, I, I can't tell you the number of times that I have seen people come in with, with all the talent in the world, but they don't get it done. You know, and, and at the end of the day, the question is simply, did you get it done? You know, did you actually win the game? You know, it's it's we can go back and we can look at games from last year that we should have won or we could have won or, you know, but the truth is, in the end, it doesn't matter. You know, did, did we get completely slammed or did, was it a super close game? It doesn't matter. You either won it or you didn't win it. It's black and white. It's A or B. Uh, and and uh to, to sit there and say it's execution that wins you games to have to get out there and execute and actually make it happen. Um, I don't, I just loved it. It, it was a, it was a quote that, that really rung out to me. This one actually might truly be a number one quote for me. Uh, but I, you know, I have a personal stake in how that, um, and, and quotes like that. So that's my number one, Todd Munkin, talent alone, get you beat execution, wins you games. I had no idea you were a student of leadership. Hmm. We've talked. I've talked about it before, probably before you came on this. I had I had you know time to fill without a co-host, so I probably talked about that a little bit. <laughs> no, yeah, you have. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, it makes sense now. That's why you're so big on culture. Yeah, like, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It makes perfect. Oh sense. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we talk about that. Uh, you know, in in leadership circles, that's 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 the number one thing. In fact, I w- I would tell you, and this solely comes from a leadership thing. Uh, culture culture trumps. Um, everything else, it, it, it is the hidden factor and people can disagree with me all they want on that. And that's fine. But it is, it is for long-term sustained success in anything. You have to have a good culture and I can walk into just about any organization and within five minutes, start talking to you about the type of culture that they have there. It's, it's, it, it, you can just feel it. So are you a culture guru? I, you know, I wouldn't say I'm a guru. I'd say I'm an enthusiast. I'm a culture enthusiast. (laughs) There you go. So, oh, that could land you a job like in the minor leagues, maybe. There you go. Maybe I'm just trying to be humble. I don't know. But yeah. there you go. I would love a job, by the way, to just go be a cult. There, there's a job some organizations are calling a cultural architect. Like their mm-hmm. whole job is to help create and define a culture for an organization. That would be an amazing job for me. I would love that. Stay off Twitter. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that would be a cool job uh, i wouldn't know how to start it but i mean obviously you do mm. all right well honorable mentions uh yeah, let's I get to few, it. <laughs> uh, yeah i'm just gonna run uh through some of these if you find any interesting you want to talk about you know feel free to interrupt uh if i find one that i want to expound upon a little bit then i will uh i have mike bajaki in the qb coach uh the biggest thing i took from him was that uh Jameis needs to have a better understanding of situational football. Uh, basically, to boil that down to its bare essence is, is a punt's not bad. You know, mm-hmm. uh, make the team go further than uh, a little further than they were before the, the play. Before, uh, yeah, uh, the punt's not the worst thing in the world. It's, it's, it can be a good thing at sometimes. Um, Especially if then, your punter can drain it and get it trapped inside the five yard line because of the gunners you have. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. So especially, yeah, in our team with with our boy, the the ung the anger onger. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think I'm gonna start calling him that. Uh, I thought some interesting things out of out of uh, Warhop was uh. If I go back, for- let, let me go back to Bajinkian real quick, just because you were on that. Yeah. Um, yeah, something yeah. I found real interesting was, and I might I might have misunderstood him, but I'm pretty sure what I heard him say was. I spend most of my time with Jameis and not a lot of time with the other guys. I I, I think yeah yeah. Did I miss? I, I think I I was like wow that's that's interesting that's, as a position coach. And I mean I get that and I get why you would do that. But wow, well, he's like a QB. he's he's the QB coach. Yeah, 
<laughs> right. Like, do you have an assistant QB coach that hangs out with the other guys? Like, um, there's only there's only two other guys, and maybe right. this year it might be only one other guy. Right. I uh, mean, yeah. Uh, yeah, I just I would think it, you know in practice you have them together like they're uh, together as a group. So I don't know. Uh, I just found that real interesting uh, from a from a QB coaching standpoint. So go go ahead, uh, Warhop. Yeah, Warhop. Uh, I thought it was interesting just for survival as a backup offensive lineman. You you, you play multiple positions. I thought that was just you know kind mm-hmm. of interesting. Like oh, uh, that's why they all cross train. And, and he's right. You know, uh, the more valuable you make yourself to the team, the harder it is to get rid of you. Kind of like uh, mm-hmm. or a boy Russell Shepard who they kept trying to cut but kept sticking around. Right. You know, I could, well, I, I think play, I, I think in a lot of ways that's why we ha- still have Kevin Pam Phil on the roster. Um, like like that's why a, besides being a starter. It, well, besides no, but like that's that's part of what has really kept him around and 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 has raised his oh. stock so to, to become gotcha. a starter to go from from kind of a you know backup development guy to working his way into being a starter because apparently he's our number one tackle guy. Uh, but he started all last year as a guard. Like the, the fact that he had that flexibility, um, you know, made him more valuable to the team. Yeah. Agreed. hundred percent. That's why I thought that was interesting. He did give a little props to Leonard Wester. He said he's doing, he thought he was doing a fantastic job during the off season. I believe he actually used the word spring, but who knows? Mm-hmm. Uh, he didn't get how some of the remember when we were scratching our heads when all your favorite things in the whole entire world mock drafts were coming out, <laughs> right? And, and and people were talking about, oh yeah, you know, Bucks are going to take an offensive lineman in the first round. And he was just like, yeah, no, like yeah, I didn't get that. I thought that was funny. Yeah, he said he said because I wrote that one down. That was one of mine. He said I, I'm not worried about depth. If I was worried, I would have been screaming for it on draft day. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you know. Like they've been saying, and we've been hearing from everybody. Uh, yeah, they're they're okay with the off the line, and now they've proved it. Uh, and the whole Donovan Smith kind of like, yeah, I don't want to call it a rant or a tirade, but you know, a little got on a soapbox and Donovan Smith for president. Uh, that whole thing. I mean, he actually said he's an unbelievable talent. So, and he said expect great things from Donovan Smith and watch out for him this year. So I just wanted to say that. Uh, Tim Spencer, running back coach. I thought it was interesting that he said that Martin sets the tone for the other running backs. Yeah. And they kind of come up to his level. Yeah. I, I, th- I thought that was really interesting. So it looks like Martin's the leader uh, there in the on the practice field in the running back's room. Um, I was happy to hear him say that uh, the new rookie, uh, McNichols, doesn't look out of place when you can move him to inside or you move him outside or put him in the slot. Uh, he kind of looks like he already knows what he's doing there. Um, hey, let me, let me, let me, I'm sorry. Yeah. Let me interrupt you. I want to, uh, this kind of goes back to really our, our last segment where we're talking about news, but I saw something today that, that, uh, you bring it up, Doug Martin of talking about how he sets the tone for the rest of the backs and everybody else comes up to his level. I read today that, uh, green Bay has approached Tampa Bay about trading for Doug Martin and kind of said a name, get left at a name your price. Have, did you hear about that? And if not even still, like, what are your thoughts about the idea of maybe trading Doug Martin for a name your price over to the Packers? Uh, I would do it. <laughs> I have not heard or seen anything about it, honestly. Uh, I was doing this pretty cool. Uh, this guy was ran an NFL thread and had like 50 questions. Some of them were, you know, I didn't like too much, but, you know, it was fun to do. I kind of started out telling people like, eh, kind of sorry, you know, the ribs aren't going to be done for four hours, so uh, I'm just going to kill time and do this Twitter thread. Uh, and one of his questions was, who wins the MVP? And instantly popped in my head was, well, if the Packers get a true running back, then it's Aaron Rodgers to lose. Mm-hmm. So, and I could have sworn that they picked one up, like, somebody that i knew so i clicked on their website real quick and went to their roster and they haven't like you know uh it's a bunch of rookies and like ty montgomery um the wide receiver who you know uh they turn into a running back and i guess this year he's gonna play running back i don't know if he's gonna switch his number it was it was really weird watching number 88 run it between the tackles a lot last year but so going back to that point yeah i mean you know if i was a green bay fan i would want yeah, Doug Martin would be a, a great fix, a nice, quick, easy fix. Um, and the reason I think they should do it is because they have the depth. They're going to go three games without him anyway. Uh, they're used to him not playing. He barely played last year, as you pointed out. 
Uh, they have Jokic Rogers. They have Charles Sims. Uh, they have, uh, you know, Jeremy Nichols, who I think is going to be, this might just be fandom talk, but I think it's going to be a big diamond in the rough. Uh, they had to teach Charles Sims all that stuff mm-hmm. about being comfortable outside and, and, and uh, playing in the slot. And it looks like, you know, Jeremy is already ahead of the curve as far as that comes. And another thing that I was, that I was going to get to is, uh, you know, they love Peyton Barber. Like mm-hmm. the running back coach couldn't say enough about him. You, right. you, uh, Tim Spencer, uh, same time, you know, unsolicited. Uh, Jason Light always talks about Peyton Barber. Uh, so they're more than comfortable with what they have. And if it's name your price, yeah, right. Right. you know, yeah, take it. And and like I've said before in previous podcasts, Doug Martin's in PED. You know, he's in the drug rehab protocol program whatever you want to call it and one more test negative test or positive test however you want to look at it positive test he's gone for a year Mm -hmm. you you know uh how pissed are we going to be as buck fans if that he comes you know if maybe he doesn't even make it to into game three maybe he i don't think he's going to but you know obviously he got popped five times he didn't stop the first four Mm -hmm. (laughs) after getting popped because it takes five boy, it, to get suspended four games, you got to get you got to get uh, test uh, positive five times. So there's lots of things. Then the trust, and then maybe the contract doesn't work out. Who knows? You know, uh, they might showcase them a lot during preseason and do it. Uh, off the top of my head, I I I would take that offer very seriously. Yeah, I I don't know. It, it's I'm torn on it, and and it, you know if they go out and they they. Offer, you know, if if we ask for something ridiculous and ridiculous comes in, um, the depth we have in the in the running back room right now, uh, yeah, I could see us do it. Are we going to be a better team with Doug Martin on the team as as opposed to uh, not being on the team? Possibly, and you know, a lot of people are saying, "Hey, listen, this is the year we're really looking at making a big run." Do we do we lose who is who is the running back that sets the tone for the rest of the backs? Um, you know, I don't know. Um, that's a real interesting, real interesting deal. And I'm not going to debate what the what ridiculous kind of a thing should be. But if they're willing to offer it and they're willing to actually give it up, and it's it's it, that's what I would say is it better be a, a deal that is too good to pass up. Um, you know, and I mean, I'm maybe not quite on the level of the deal that Houston made with uh, the Browns uh, for taking dude off their oh, roster. God. Um, I mean, that's just, we, if you're Houston and you get somebody to agree to that, you just, you have to take it. But, yeah. uh, you know, um, you know, but we, we have, we have room, you know, we, we have other people, our running back situation certainly looks a whole hell of a lot better than theirs. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. Anyway, sorry. Uh, honorable mentions about people talking, uh, <laughs> from pre- <laughs> coaches in the press conferences. Yeah, uh, I kind of just went. I kind of covered all the Tim Spencer uh, things I had talking about that Doug Martin trade. Finished. I, up I on had that. I had one there that you didn't that you didn't say about Tim Spencer. Uh, he talked about Jacquez Rogers dropping a lot of weight, and uh, when he was pressed on, he was like, "Yeah, he lost you know like six seven pounds, lost a lot of weight." <laughs> I thought that was humorous. Uh, well, yeah, I mean that's eye ra- that's eye raising for you because you can drop probably six pounds if you you know go run around the track a few times right right six six to seven pounds is water weight for me so <laughs> exactly, exactly. Like you guys you make me sound like i'm so big i'm i'm i mean i'm a big guy but dang uh well what are you six four what two what three two nothing <laughs> two, two nothing three yeah six so you're six four three hundred plus right yeah 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 uh and we all agree that swaggy baker is a big dude right yeah He's only three twenty. Yeah, I'm bigger than him, but uh, yeah. you know. So yeah, you're a big dude. Yeah, I'm. Oh, I'm a big dude. It just you know. Uh, but yeah, six to seven pounds. Uh, I just it just made me made me laugh. But he did talk about how you can't run over Jacquez. Like he's a no. little guy, but he's a plug. He's a he's a he's a he's a plug stopper. Like like defensive linemen are not going to run him over. So um, you know, it's just part of what makes him so great with with uh, having him there on the team. So. Uh, do you have any others real quick before we, we move on? I did. Uh, I'll, I'll be a little more selective. Uh, 
Oh, this I thought interesting. Uh, also, Brent Maxey, the uh, DB slash safety coach, uh, talked about how when they're at home, the defense really has to rely on nonverbal communication because the crowd's going to be loud right. trying to, which is something like I started thinking about last year. It's like, yeah, we're being real loud, so the offense you know, can't hear the snap and they have to do hand signals, but you're doing the same thing to your defense, <laughs> which right. you know, it's like it's it's talk about double-edged sword. It's like, ah, with so – but I, they don't seem to mind, and that's just kind of like one of those things the way it is. So we leave it there. I just thought it was interesting to bring that up. Uh, Beckwith apparently is going to be ready for training camp. So that time we talked about he might be on IR or pup. I don't mm-hmm. it, unless he re-enters it. That's not going to happen. Um, uh, um, yeah, that, but that sounds good to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I've got I've got two I've got two that you've not brought up then. Um, Go uh, going back to our special teams coordinator, Nate Kaxor. I, I don't know how you say it. Um, I just found this real interesting. He said that the incumbent gunners that we have are the ones who are slotted to play and, uh, it's going to require other people to beat them out. Like it, it's not an open competition. So you're talking about the Josh Robinson, the Ryan Smith, the, um, I feel like there's a, yeah. Like it's those two guys chef. like, yeah, it used to be. Yeah. So those they are kind of already slotted in like that's their role. That's their job. They already have it. Um, and you're going to have to beat them out in order to get it. Uh, I, I just found that real interesting. Like it's not just this open competition uh, to see who can get it. Um, you know, like the, the quicker situation or the safety. The, yeah. Safety, something like that. Uh, so there was that one. And then the other one that I found really interesting um, was Ben Steele, our tight ends coach talking about OJ Howard. Uh, just really just clarifying, uh, you know, everybody's high praise for OJ Howard and they should be, and they ought to be, but you're saying OJ Howard is an every down tight end. Um, and the thought that we could see him out there, you know, every down, uh, for the bucks, it, it, it just adds to the excitement of having this guy on our roster. Um, you know, this isn't a guy who's going to need to necessarily be rotating in and out, uh, you know, frequently. And I don't know how often tight ends rotate in and out anyway, but, um, I just I found that real interesting that you know they it, it was enough that that Coach Steele felt it worth mentioning that un, it seemed almost unlike some of the other guys he is in every down back so uh, super excited for what that could mean for our tight end group and um, all those guys. There you go. All right. Well, uh, PewterCast listeners, now we'd like to know how your picks stack up against our picks. And hey, did you have any other? Honorable mentions, because I think we just ran through the entire list of press conferences. <laughs> uh, well, you can let us know on Twitter at the Pewtercast or at Facebook.com forward slash the Pewtercast. Shoot us an email to the Pewtercast at gmail.com. Well, Ren, before we get out of here, why don't we take a look at this week's poll? It's real bad. Okay? I don't like those numbers at all. Just one poll? Those things aren't scientific. Yes, they are. All this is is science. This is math. All right, for this week's poll, we thought we'd ask, who do you prefer to back up Jameis? Obviously, coming off the Ryan Fitzpatrick uh, signing. So uh, the choices we gave out there was Ryan Fitzpatrick. We actually threw in Mike Glennon, our guy from last year, You know, if you had to pick between the two, or Ryan Griffin. Uh, or we left open a tweet back your own response answer. Um, so before we reveal that, Ren, uh, what do you think? Who would you prefer to see in as the backup spot for uh, Jameis Winston? Uh, if I had my pick, I think I would pick Mike Glennon just because he's been in the offense two years uh, over Ryan Fitzpatrick. Uh, nothing against Ryan Fitzpatrick. Uh, I kind of think they're probably a wash talent-wise. Uh, but, um, yeah, two years in the offense is, you know, if Jameis goes down week two for, say, you know, he hurts himself second quarter week two, but it'll be fine for week three, uh, that's give, you know, Ryan Fitzpatrick, like, what four months in the offense three months in the offense and mike lennon has a full two years to be working on three years so that's why i went with mike lennon it was close though well ren i think we may have a first time that has just first happened time, here on, first time i miss i missed the twitter question first time you are not in agreement with the majority uh 62 percent of our respondents said for ryan fitzpatrick uh, that they would like to see him over. And, I mean, he he, he slammed. Mike Glennon only hit 24%. Ryan Griffin hit 10%. And uh, 4% of you guys said that you were going to tweet back your own pick. 
but ended. no one did. <laughs> wah, wah, wah. We gotta st- we really gotta stop giving that choice. Yeah, we do. We, yeah. yeah, I'm just gonna stop because yeah. no, very rarely do nobody they does it. Or no does or it. when they do, they tweet back somebody who isn't even eligible for you know. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. The, the like answer. your fantasy football friend from last time. Yeah, that's why. Who's he was the second. best new Twitter follow? Quad Alexander. Okay, <laughs> new Twitter follow. Nick, I I do not endorse. Uh, I I love you and I appreciate you responding because at least you responded. Uh, <laughs> but you were wrong. Uh, all right, guys. Well, that's going to do it for this segment. Uh, coming up next, we're going to take a look and see what you guys are talking to us about. Uh, stay with us. We'll be right back. Hey, PewterCast fans, I just wanted to take this moment to say thank you to everyone who has been supporting the show. Whether you've taken the time to leave us an iTunes review, which helps new listeners find us, or you've sent us an email, you've tweeted us, or left us a comment on Facebook, we love interacting with you, our listeners. Or perhaps you've gone the extra step in helping the show out financially by leaving a one-time donation at paypal.me forward slash the PewterCast. Every dollar goes back into making this show the best possible Buccaneers podcast out there. So in whatever way you've chosen to support the show, thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Welcome back to the pewter cast. This is episode 36 Phase two begins, and it is time for our brand new favorite uh, way to close out the show, our fan interaction segment. Uh, this is a spot where we get to uh, come back and, and spend a little bit of time talking with you guys, uh, our fans or listeners here to the show. Uh, so this is where we'll be if we've gotten any emails, uh, any iTunes reviews. You definitely please make sure you leave us some iTunes reviews, uh, anything on Twitter. And Ren, I got to tell you, boy, oh boy, oh boy, this last week we've had a lot, and I mean a lot of interaction with our fans. We've had several emails that have come through. We've had several tweets, uh, several messages on Facebook, which has been just been amazing. Um, and you know, one of the things that we say, one of the hallmarks of, of this show is we say, listen, we, we will respond to every bit of feedback that we get or every, every interaction, like we'll, we'll interact with it in some way. Um, a lot of the interaction that we got was as a result of the show that we had last week and, uh, just kind of a little heart to heart that we had had last week. Uh, that said, we received some amazing feedback from a lot of people, uh, from a lot of our listeners out there. Um, a lot of really positive feedback. And so Ren and I just kind of for that, we want to say thank you guys so much for sending that back in. Uh, you know who you are. Uh, we really appreciate it. It means a ton to us. I think we probably responded to quite a bit of that. However, um, for the subject matter and everything, we're just going to not, uh, we're not going to go through each one of those uh, here in this segment tonight. Uh, you know, we're going to let that topic just kind of go there. Um, but uh, we're, we're going to talk about some other things. But I didn't I did want to address those of you who took the time to shoot us an email or a tweet or a Facebook or actually engage in a dialogue with us. Several of you guys decided to do that and just say thank you for doing that. It was amazing. We love getting to talk with the listeners here of the show of the pewter cast. Yeah, it was great. And uh, we just it seems like the whole issue has been put to bed. And uh, yeah. thankfully so. And it seems that like uh, everybody uh, in Buck fandom have, are kind of like back on the right track, and and everyone's behind the Bucks, and uh, it's onward and upward. So uh, full steam ahead. Uh, let's go. Yeah, yeah, let's do it. So uh, that said, we did get some other emails and other tweets and, and things that came in that that uh, you know we get to have a little bit of fun with. Uh, and so I'm going to go to email first. We got an email this week from a guy, John uh, Coughlin, I think is how we probably pronounce his name. Uh, where it was, it was real short. It was real sweet. What he said was, 
Uh, he said, love the show. Keep up the great work. And then he sent his list, his list for the 53 man roster as he sees it, as he predicts it coming up, um, which was real. Interesting. He did his own 53 man roster, his, his own 53 man roster, his own way, way, way too early 53 man roster. Just like I like did. the dedication. I, I like do. It. I do. So I would like to encourage you guys, if you have your 53 man roster, send it in. We'd, we'd love to take a look at it and see it's, it's fun to read what you guys have. Cause we know what we have. We you know, I'm looking at the board right now of what we have. Uh, that, that we had said here on this show uh, that gets boring to look at. I want to see what you guys have. I, I'm not going to read his entire 53 man roster, but there are a few surprises I did want to want to uh, bring out. Uh, a couple of those are uh, in the wide receiver. Of course, he has the the main four of Mike Evans, Deshaun, Chris Godwin, Adam Humphreys, but then he he has two more in Darrell Walker and Josh Huff, uh, which I thought was real interesting. Um, I don't know that I I foresee Josh Huff making the 53 man roster again this year, uh, but it'll be real interesting. Uh, so I, I thought that was uh, that was something. Um, Ray- yeah, I like it. Yeah, I mean, I, I went with five wide receivers, and those were like between those were the two. Uh, uh, Huff because of his returnability, um, he's got speed. He just had a really bad couple of weeks with the team <laughs> only happened to be the couple of weeks he was there but they hung on to him so we'll see in training camp and walkers the kid uh if i'm not mistaken who uh played with mike evans uh at texas a&m and then went to the canadian league and you know tore it up a bunch of catches bunch of yardage and he was actually he's actually by my kind of like inside guy to take the uh five wide receiver spot i only kept five but uh mm-hmm. yeah i mean that's solid yeah, he he also he only kept two quarterbacks, uh, Jameis and, and Ryan Fitzpatrick. Um, he had Anthony O'Claire as one of our, our tight ends that we have. Only had four tight ends. Um, the offensive line looked pretty pretty familiar. Uh, defensive line uh, looks uh, looks pretty familiar to um, uh, to what everybody else would have had. He did have in his linebacker core. He had Levante David, Quan Alexander, Kendall Beckworth. Jeff Knox, Darius Glanton, and Paul Maglior. Ma- Maglor. Um, I'm gonna <laughs> I ha- I have to learn I how to say his Mag- name. I think it's McGlory. McGlory. I'm gonna have to learn how to pronounce his name uh, for various reasons. But um, so I, I found that was a real interesting grouping that he had there with the linebackers. Yeah, uh, I'm a little shocked. Knox is there. Uh, I totally agree with Glanton. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm shocked that Bond is not on there. Right. Uh, Glanton is gonna, I think, really gonna like. Uh, I think he makes a team, but I think he's going to uh, sort of be that super utility guy uh, mm-hmm. that that the, the Bucks, you know, like to keep hanging around. Mm-hmm. Uh, he'll play special teams, but uh, I've said I, it many times. Go ahead. I was gonna say I heard rumor that he is actually the guy who's kind of fingered to replace Russell Shepard as the captain of the special teams. Oh, where'd you hear that from? Someone out there on Twitter or a <laughs> podcast or something somewhere. I'm not going to quote. I don't remember my source. I just remember hearing it was a Darius Clinton because I and and what stood out to me is because I've been saying Josh Robinson, but when this other this other guy said it was a Darius Clinton, I was like, huh, that's interesting, different from what I thought it'd be, but uh, just rumor. Carry on. No, I I, I mean, yeah. it, and I think that's a solid opinion too. I can make a really great argument for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the only one that really surprises me is Knox. Uh, uh, obviously, I would switch out Knox for Bond. I didn't bring up uh, Bond in the uh, top three, but uh, I did have it written down um, that the linebackers coach was very impressed. How even though he kind of have a red shirt year, that uh, he spent he really applied himself to the X's O's of Mike Smith's defense. Mm -hmm. So I think he has a really big leg up as far uh, as, as Beckwith uh, going into camp. Not that I don't think Beckwith is going to make the team, but uh, he's definitely got, got a big step up. And since he just kind of got red shirted, everyone just kind of forgot about, about, you know, what he can do and what he has done. He was kind of injury played at Oklahoma, but uh, his, his sacks were off the charts uh, pressuring and tackles for loss at Juco. So um, I think he's a better athlete people give him credit for. So we'll see. But, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, that makes sense to me. 
Yeah. Um, cornerbacks uh, groups looks pretty pretty familiar. Safety group looks pretty familiar. Special teams looks pretty familiar, except for uh, our boy had Roberto Aguayo as our kicker as opposed to Nick Folk. Um, probably the most surprising thing on that particular when did, 53 man roster. When did he send that email? Uh, <laughs> was it before uh, OTAs? What was the date? It was 10 days ago, May 19th. So yeah, before OTAs. Um, so we'll, you know, we'll, we'll see how that holds out. Uh, as we say, Roberto Guay will not be cut until the 90 man, uh, cut down and who knows what can happen between now and then. So, uh, but either way, John, thank you so much for sending that in. Uh, really appreciate it. Thanks for taking the time to actually, um, you know, go through and, and, uh, give us what you thought. Uh, I really, and actually he, I should send this over to you. He's formatted it really well. It's nice and pretty. It's easy to read. Um, you know, he's got the, he's got the position and then the number of people he kept in each one. And then, you know, the nice. names, uh, yeah, he, he did a good job with it. So, uh, and before we you. get off this, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about Paul McGlory. I hope I'm saying his name, right. I talked a little bit about him on the, uh, the 53 man way too early 53 man uh-huh. roster episode. But, uh, just to recap for, for people who haven't heard that or, or might've forgotten, this guy is a freak athlete he actually went to Appalachia State as a quarterback they moved him to running back uh I think he didn't really feel like he he had a a future there so he went to a junior college West Arizona uh I believe yeah Western Arizona they went like 11 and 1 he played safety there uh and then he got some actually he committed to Arizona the University of Arizona uh but then after that season at JUCO, he got started getting offers from uh, some Pac-12 teams. He actually got some offers from SEC teams, but he wanted to uh, honor his commitment to Arizona and went there, and he was a safety. Then all of a sudden, the linebacking core in front of him all get injured, and they're like, hey, you know, <laughs> you're an athlete. Can you play linebacker? And he moved in there, and he just played one season at linebacker, and he's done, just been shooting up the charts. Uh, people were shocked that he wasn't drafted. Uh, so the Bucks are really uh, glad they got this guy in camp, and I would not be surprised at all if he if he makes that linebacking core. He'll be playing special teams, and he can. But uh, yeah, he's one of the one of those uh, undrafted free agents that I'm very high on. Uh, not just because I like him, but I, I'm very high on because I actually think he's going to make the team. Very good. Yeah, I, I, he's he's a guy that that honestly was not on my radar until I started hearing about him actually from you, and uh, he's he's just he's one of the guys I think I'm watching now more so than than any of the others. So, all right, uh, moving on, uh, let's jump over to Facebook. We actually had a, a question. Um, Nick Anderson on Facebook asked if we liked the Ryan Fitzpatrick signing. I think we've uh, probably sufficiently covered that earlier in this episode, uh, but just to sum it up, to say, yeah. Thumbs up for me. There you go. I liked it. Um, all right. Uh, some stuff on Twitter. Um, man, this <laughs> these last two weeks on Twitter was a lot of fun. Um, a lot of fun. And and I, I got to tell you, because I, I run the PeterCast Twitter account, obviously, and it really felt like uh, for several days all I did was just hang out with you guys, the listeners, talking about the Bucks, which was awesome for me. Um uh, I hope I didn't neglect my kids while doing that, but um, it was it was a lot of fun. There's just lots of, of fun banter going back and forth, uh, and kind of like we said about the the other the other stuff. There's no way I can recount all of the tweets that came in, nor would it be interesting for you guys to listen to again. Um, <laughs> so if I don't read your tweet, don't take offense. Uh, but there were a few that I wanted to pull out and and talk about um, that I thought were, were, uh, just kind of particularly fun. Uh, first and foremost, uh, is from our friend, Kevin Sloan, who is a, uh, he is a, a, a an avid Petercast listener. He listens to, I think just about every Bucks podcast that's out there. Yeah, um, super, he, super fan. He is. He absolutely, he's in every single instant cast that we do. Uh, if he doesn't call in, he's definitely in the, um, in the chat room. Uh, and he, he's almost always one of the first ones who's in, you know, um, and uh, he put out a tweet uh, here over the last couple of weeks that said, Twitter fam and friends, I wanted to share an update, health update uh, with his urologist. Today he found out he is in remission. Uh, so great news for a fellow Bucks fan and a big part of our PeterCast community. Uh, congratulations, Kevin. Just wanted to uh, send lots of love and send a shout out to you over there. 
Yeah, and uh, we are recording this on Monday, and happy Memorial Day to you, because Kevin is a vet as well. So, uh, yeah. huge Bucks fan, like you said, you can find him like in any chat room that I go to. If I'm listening to a live podcast, Kevin's there too. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I mean, he is he's all over the place. So, uh, yeah, best wishes, congratulations, and and happy Memorial Day, my friend. Uh, uh, congratulations, and we'll get to see you on Twitter and and in the chat rooms for years to come. Yeah, absolutely. Super, super stoked for that um, and, and what that means for you. So uh, a couple other guys, Scott Ledger tweeted us, said he really enjoyed the roster show. Very thought provoking. Good stuff. Uh, thanks, Scott. Really uh, appreciate comments on that. Um, the roster show that really seemed to set off something because we got another tweet that leads right into that or comes right off of that um, from our friend Greg Allman, father of uh Pewtercast guest Riley Almond said uh, he tweeted out. I, I didn't know that, that Greg actually listened to our show, but he tweeted out said some really good thoughts in here. Lots of discussion on roster battles ahead for the Bucks. So he retweeted us uh, and, and put out uh, the link to our show. So Greg, thank you so much for that. Um, really appreciate it. That uh, you know, for anybody who says that, but uh, definitely um, meant a lot coming from Greg. He's a guy who's uh, helped us out with a lot uh, of stuff over the years. Yeah, when. He has. And, and when I first started getting serious, I mean, like serious, like way too deep, like I like to say <laughs> about being to the Bucks, like, oh, you're crazy. Well, yeah, but I, I found it interesting. Uh, I used to balance questions off him all the time, mm -hmm. and he was always extremely gracious, and uh, he would answer them. Um, yeah. And, and usually like in a very timely manner. Mm -hmm. So and then when I, you know, I kind of figured out that he listens to our show, I, you know, it was like. Yeah, I don't know. It was like it was like I guess like being like a movie director and then like, oh yeah, Spielberg's a fan of your film. What? Huh? Yeah, huh? Yeah. What? Yeah, it was like it really made me feel good. I'm just glad he listens. Uh uh he's one he's one of the shows our favorites, uh Brent and I's uh Bucks follow. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, so it's just mm -hmm. it, it it does. It makes us feel good that we know that Greg's out there listening to us. Yeah, and and if you guys don't, he actually runs a couple of books podcasts. He runs the Cannon Fodder podcast, which uh, kind of comes and goes. I think just depending on the topics. Uh, some he just did a summer series uh, or a, a spring series leading up to the draft with his son Riley. He does some stuff with Rick Stroud uh, throughout the season, uh, but he also does the Locked On Bucks podcast, which um, it, I love this podcast because it's it's usually about twenty minutes or so. And it's just the, hey, here's the news from the last 24 hours kind of a thing. Like, it's just a recap. Like, if you didn't hear, here's what these things are. And and to me, truth be told, like, that's what the official Tampa Bay Buccaneers podcast should be. Like, yeah. that, that's that's yeah. that's just what they should be. So And they're, uh, they're kind of doing it. Have you noticed that they're doing, like, Casey's doing those one-minute segments? It, it, are they day. putting them out? Are they putting them out on the the podcast? Because I've not noticed them. If they are, oh no, the, no, no, they're on the. Uh, it's a one minute video segment with uh -huh. you know Casey, Casey Phillips. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, I've seen those. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's just they yeah. put them out. Well, not this Monday, but they put them out every day and just kind of tell yeah. you what happened and what goes on. I mean, obviously, Greg twenty minutes goes a little more in depth to it, which I like. But yeah, I'm I'm right on there with you. Like that's what the Buckner podcast needs to be. It needs to be like. This is what happened. This is how it affects us. You know, this mm -hmm. guy signed. This guy's hurt. Yeah, it's 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 a real nice, easy, great listen. Keeps you very informed. Yeah, I, I often say, you know, here at the Pewtercast, we don't report the news. We just comment on the news. Uh, Locked on Bucks and Greg, they are reporting the news. So, um, you know, certainly, uh, certainly, make sure you guys follow it, especially during the season, because Greg's coming out with that thing like every day. Like, I don't know, he's already Five up days. to. Yeah, he's already up to like 150 episodes. We're on episode 36, but we've been doing this for over a year now. So go figure. Uh, and we do sometimes twice a week uh, in season. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, enough of that. Um, let's see here. At Buck79 uh, in a ref. I, so I sent out a tweet. Um, Good Morning Football talks about the Bucks a lot. And, and maybe it's just because I'm not used to national – um, media giving the Bucks any any amount of attention, so the sheer right. amount that they talk about the Bucks just feels like a lot. And and I sent out a tweet where I said it really seems like Good Morning Football is having a love affair with the Bucks. Um, and so Buck seventy nine said, I noticed this last year. Peter started jumping on the ship right after the Seattle game. Guy looks like a kid in a candy shop every time he's talking about the Bucks. Yeah, that's true. Uh, <laughs> and I, it's it's weird because I'm not really sure as a Bucks fan how to handle it. 
<laughs> like it, it took me like it took me a while to be okay with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was, you know, because let's face it, there are times when, you know, you switch to certain networks and you know, you're going to see about the Patriots and you're going to hear about the Steelers and you're going to hear about the Cowboys. And, you know, there's, there's about six teams that they only really report on. Uh-huh. Like anything at all happens with those teams. It's on that network. Right. And they don't talk about a lot of other teams, especially small market teams. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, the Bucks fall into that. And plus, you know, we don't win a lot of games recently in past past years, so it's really kind of hard to argue. So I kind of felt guilty about how much they're talking about. I'm like, mm-hmm. do other fans get pissed at us? You know, like, oh, what's mm-hmm. all what's all this crap? The Bucks, they stink. They never, you know, they only won nine games, first winning season in like eight years. Like, mm-hmm. why the hell are they on here? So. I kind of felt like that, and then it took me a little while, but I'm over it now. I'm just like, well, tough crap, you know. This is this is yeah. it's just it's my time. I say I I don't care about that. I just love seeing Jameis and Allie and and Jason Light yeah, and great, Nick great. Carter from NSYNC or Backstreet Boys or I don't know one of those um, talking about O-Town. his yeah his love for the Bucks or you know whatever. So uh, I just you know talk about them more. Do it. I, I'll watch your show just to watch the segment with the Bucks. So. Um, but uh, for whatever, I am a fan of Good Morning Football having a love affair with the Bucks, uh, just because I like to watch those. So uh, <laughs> I thought that was funny. Uh, our friend Pinnacle, um, he uh, sent us a message in reference. He got a little choppy with us there, Ren. Uh, in our last episode, we had mentioned that uh, Charles Sims may be a surprise cut. Uh, and you and I had both talked about the idea that, that Charles Sims may may actually get cut, it, You know, especially if we don't trade Doug Martin. Um, you know, he might be the sleeper, um, cause somebody's going to have actually about half of this, this running back core is going to have to go. Um, and, uh, he said that Sims isn't in trouble. If anyone's the odd man out, it's Peyton Barber. Just look at his games last year to which I, I couldn't refute. Um, you know, I, I think the only thing I would say is, you know, I, and I think we were clear with this when we said it, if I'm a betting man, I'm putting money on Charles Sims being in a Buccaneers uniform this coming year. I was just saying he could be – it might be a surprise to some people if he could be cut. And on the other side, it might not be a surprise since we've kind of said that it could be him. So, Right. Uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't disagree more with Pinnacle. And, and, and uh, we don't disagree on a lot, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, I see him a lot on my Twitter timeline. We comment back and forth on each other's tweets a lot. By the way, he's another uh, guy who shows up in chat rooms a lot and listening to yeah. uh, live, live Bucks podcasts. So thank you for joining yeah. us, Pinnacle. Uh, good friend of yeah, the show. Agreed. Yeah, hundred um, percent. But yeah, I mean, I just the more you hear the Bucks talk about Peyton Barber, the more you're just like, like it's almost to the point, like, how are they going to cut this guy? It's like they love his upside so much, and I've talked about it. Uh, he needs to learn pass pro. Uh, and that's kind of what kept him on the, off the field. Uh, you know, they even said in in the uh, the presser that uh, he is now a three down back, and then he kind of modified it in some situations, which means you know there's still some situations where they don't want him in there, where he's just in there to pick up pass protection. Is how I'm reading it, but they just they love that guy. And if, if and if you held a gun to my head and you said Rogers, McNichols, Sims, and Barber, the Bucks are going to cut one. Who's it going to be? It's Sims. I'm sorry. It is. That's that's how I feel. Uh, not that I don't think he's a good player, but he has problems with injuries, and he's only one dimensional. I said it last podcast. He's now pigeonholed himself into like a a four minute offense or a two minute offense back. And if you're not going to run the ball, put him in the game because he can't run the ball. There so you anyway, go. Sorry, Pinnacle. <laughs> that's, that's, what I got. that's what I got. I'm sorry. I mean, I I understand what you're saying, but I I just I I I disagree. And Pinnacle, if you have any responses, you can catch him at Ren underscore Daxt or just tweet us at the Pewtercast and uh, we'll certainly talk to you about that. So, um, yeah, uh, let's see here. Uh, B Wall Street 1335, uh, in reference to a tweet that we had about Ryan Griffin, uh, said, um, and it's pertinent, it just uh, says, I'm a Bucks fan and that's not why I think he's terrible. It says his preseason play is as bad as it gets. His practice, he is practice squad talent at best. Uh, we already covered earlier that Ryan Griffin is no longer uh, eligible for practice squad. 
Uh, at least that information comes from, I think Riley told us that. Um, it's it's true. It's two accrued I, years. Yeah. And since he's been on the roster for two years, that's right. it. Right. Back squad eligible anymore. Right. So, uh, so he has that. But um, you know, I, I to talk about about Ryan Griffin's preseason play in the two seasons that we've seen him with the Bucks, he has never stood out in preseason. Um, and and it's it, to sit there and say what is it that it has been a question mark of what the the Buccaneers brass see in Ryan Griffin um, that made him somebody that they wanted to eat up a, a roster spot with. Um, I mean, I understand that they were scared about losing Mike Glennon at any given point, but, uh, you know, what, what was it about him that made them do that? Um, you know, when, when, it, you know, should it happen that they could actually find somebody else, uh, to come in and be the backup then. So, um, uh, well, yeah. I'm, I just don't think it's a fair, it's fair. I, I, if you don't like Ryan Griffin, think he's terrible, that's fine. You know, um, but the Bucks thought enough of him to keep him hidden on the 53 man roster for two years. Uh, they get to see him practice. And the reason I don't think it's fair because preseason he's playing with a very few number twos, very mostly true. number threes yep. and a handful of number fours. He doesn't get to run with, you know, the first stringers, right. uh, and never has. So, uh, if you surround him with the starters and the talent, who knows how he could look? I mean, the Bucks do because mm-hmm. he gets the reps, not a lot, but right. because of the because well, of CBA. But go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I mean, just as an example, look at Jimmy Garoppolo last year uh, up in up in New England. Um, you know, with uh, uh, what's that guy? The the guy? The that, no, no, the other guy. Uh, yeah, that guy. Um, that guy. You know, he was sitting out his his suspension. Um, you know, the first four games and Jimmy Garoppolo men looked up there and, and just looked amazing, but he was running with all the, the Patriots number one people. So, yeah. you know, was that Jimmy Garoppolo or was that the number one people around him? Uh, you know, you make a good point there, Ren, that we haven't really seen Ryan Griffin. And, and that's all that I was trying to say of, we have not seen what Ryan Griffin is capable of um, because we've never, you know, his preseason play has not been great. But we've never seen any flashes. But is that his fault? Is it the other guy's fault? It's just hard to know, um, you know, in the middle of that. So uh, I think that's when we go back to the in light we trust, you know, <laughs> like the yeah. uh, they see something that we don't. And we just kind of got to go, uh, well, all right, we'll we'll trust you on this one. Uh, we don't see it, though. So uh, and with that, there was uh, there were several people who uh, who tweeted us talking about uh, Fitz wins the backup. You got to put Griffin on the practice squad, or uh, you got to let let Griffin go. Um, lots of people just saying this should be a two quarterback year, which uh, I think I agree with them on that. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> what are you going to do? I mean, right. I think you know his days are numbered here, and uh, 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 he could. I I, I don't know. I, I think his days are numbered. It's it's. They're not afraid, as you alluded to earlier, talking about something. I think we were talking about Aguayo, uh, you know, Fisher cut bait. They're not afraid to just keep somebody around because they've invested time in him or invested a draft pick in him or invested money in him. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's just going to come down to a numbers game. And uh, I just I just really can't see hiding him on the 53 man roster for another year, even though Fitzpatrick is a, has a one year deal. I, I just can't see it. So. Yeah, I, uh, sorry, buddy. <laughs> I don't think he's here. <laughs> I would, I would uh, certainly agree with you on that. All right, Ren. Well, that is going to wrap up. Oh, wait a minute. We've got a surprise last minute email that has just now come in uh, from a good friend of ours. Actually, another really good friend of the show, Ren. Uh, you care to take a stab at who this might be? Mm, is it a super fan? It is. It, it, I would. I would. I would classify him as a super fan. Yeah, sure. Would I find this person all over social media? Anything pertaining to the Bucks? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Another one who listens to every Bucks <laughs> content that's out there just soaks it up. Uh, good friend of the show. Hey, I, this guy. He he doesn't just show up in the chat rooms. He calls into every instant cast show that we have. Have I had a beer with this person? You have recently, as as it might be. Okay, that narrows it down to about a hundred people. Okay, uh, 
It's Chef, Chef Aaron. Chef Aaron, his last minute email just got it in. Uh, just in time, Chef. Come a little earlier next time. Uh, that's what she said. He works. Uh, he works. <laughs> he wow, does. Hello. Oh, hey <laughs> uh, He does. He, uh, I'm sure he actually just got out of the kitchen. So um, here's what he says. He says, how awesome was the reaction to those Bucks social media troll over the Falcons? And do you think it shows bad insecurities that the Falcon fans try to bash our team by keep bringing up our playoff drought when we have something that they have tried twice to get and have the biggest choke job as a result? Go Bucks, Chef Aaron, thanks for sending that in. Ren, I'll toss response to you first. Uh, I almost got into this earlier when I was talking, when we were talking about uh, Good Morning Football, uh, how I was kind of saying, do other fans like think we're getting too much pub? And this has been popping up more and more on my Twitter timeline is salty Falcons fans. Mm -hmm. Uh, Salty that we're getting national recognition. Salty that we think we have a good roster. Salty that we think we have good players. So like they're just, and it's like, like they're on top of the mountain right now and they feel like they're getting no respect. So they keep lashing out at, (laughs) at, at the, the Buccaneers and Buck fans. I've seen it. So, uh, you know, Chef's right. You know, they're both right. You could, well, you know, haven't been in the playoffs in, since X amount of years, you know, but, you know, we have the ultimate prize and you don't. Um, so it's kind of even. Uh, so, yeah, but it's, I had never seen Falcon fans on my Twitter timeline ever, you know, maybe once in a blue moon, but they're on there daily now. And I, I kind of like it, to be honest with you. Now I see why. The other, like when we did our podcast, mm-hmm. uh, when we brought in all the NFC South teams, yep. the Panthers hated the Falcons. The Saints hated the Falcons. Now I see why. Right. It's my first. It's my first like real interaction with 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 other fans. Now the Bird bra that we brought on, he was real cool. I liked him a lot, but uh, I can see why they, like they're not liked because yeah, they're they're salty. They're real salty. <laughs> yeah, salty. Salty birds. Um, salty birds can't fly. Uh, yeah, I'll take I'll take this point by point. How awesome was the reaction of the Buck social media troll over the Falcons? I think it was awesome. Uh, I clearly said I understand what Cutter is saying. I personally loved it because it was amazing, and it's part of how how uh, you know uh, Twitter works. Uh, I don't know that I'd call it a troll though. I think it was just a uh, you know the Falcons tried to start something a little friendly banter back and forth, and as Chef himself put it, they started it, we finished it. Um, there you go. Yeah. I, I just, you know, I, I agree. Uh, I, I get where coach is going and I'll get behind him on it, but, uh, I, I still think it was hilarious. Uh, do I think it shows the insecurities that Falcon fans have as they try to keep bashing our team, bringing up our playoff drought? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, because you know, until you win it, it doesn't matter how many times you're in it. Uh, should we say Buffalo bills? Uh, um, you know, should we remember that they were in it four times in a row and failed to get it every single time? They were still good enough to make it to the Super Bowl four years in a row, so that's a hell of a team. But you, you've got to be able to finish. You've got to be able to cross over. And yeah, I think it does. It 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 stings when you when you are. It's it's got to sting like uh, like it does for Dan Marino a little bit. You know, a guy who's arguably one of the best, if not the best, quarterback in the history of the NFL. Yet he doesn't have a ring. He was never able to 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 get a ring. Um, you know, it, it's you can be great, but if you don't get the ring. Ah, that sucks. Uh, and I think it, yeah, I think it absolutely shows that. And we have one, you know, we, we were able to do it. Um, now the Falcons have been in the Super Bowl, I think twice now, is that right? In their history. Mm-hmm, that's and correct. They, he, you know, I, I mean, to, to chef's point though, they've tried twice and failed and they hold the record for the biggest choke job as a result. That's just fact. You can't deny it. They, it's the only it's the only Super Bowl to ever go to overtime, and they lost it. And at one point, they were up twenty-eight to three. Vernon Hargraves, Jameis Winston. Uh, so uh, you know, uh, uh, I, I, yeah, I think I loved it. I thought it was funny. I do think it shows their their uh, their insecurities. However, there is also the point that they have been to the Super Bowl this last year. Um, which which means they're great. And as coach said, hey, listen, we were sitting at home. They were in the Super Bowl. We want to be playing in the Super Bowl. So we don't have a we don't really have a place to brag. Uh and the other side, we haven't done anything yet. 
that everything looks great on paper. It looks great in OTAs, but we haven't actually done anything yet. But man, this is going to be an awesome team. You know, like we're looking at this. I'm looking at all the names in blue on my board here. It's going to be an awesome team. So, uh, I mean, I'm excited. I'm excited for the season. And, you know, I'm going to say, I think, I think the Bucks have all the potential in the world to not only make it in the playoffs, but to, to go to the NFC championship game, to win the championship game game. And for the third year in a row, have an NFC South team represent, uh, the NFC in the Super Bowl. I'm just going to put it out there. Uh, and I think they have the absolute, the ability to be able to win it. Uh, are they going to go that far? I don't know. We'll find out, but I think we have the ability to do it. What do you think, Ren? Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> the only don't thing told say me, no. Yeah, exactly. Like <laughs> talk about setting me up. Uh, don't say no. <laughs> you can't say anything, but yes. <laughs> uh, the only thing that's going to keep back is experience. We do have some inexperience at key positions and uh, I don't have to go over them. We all know what they are. Uh, and there are some question marks, you know, uh, especially in the secondary. Who's the third corner? Who's the slot corner? Mm-hmm. The safety position's wide open. You know, we got four guys, best two are going to play. Who are they going to be? How good are they going to be? So mm-hmm. uh, I think the season's going to hinge on our defense. Are we going to, you know, be the first half where we got to be the Saints and score 40 points a game and, you know, to win? Or are we going to be the second half where, you know, if we score 24, 25 points, we're probably going to win six out of eight games so yeah we can get to the super bowl but uh, you know we got the roster for it but you know a lot of things a lot of this i don't even want to talk about it like i'm just gonna drop it from there yeah let's let's worry about the regular season i'm before not we get yeah there. i'm not talking yeah. super bowl <laughs> yeah. in phase two of ota there you go yeah let's let's that's not pumping the brakes for the record that's just we're gonna take not it one a, step at a not time not being an idiot yeah. Oh, yeah. What I said, one step at a time. Yeah, one step at a time. Uh, well, guys, that's going to do it, not only for this segment, but for this episode. Uh, just as a final reminder, you can talk to us about anything that we have talked about on today's show, including the last. What do you think of the chances of the Bucks going to the Super Bowl? Bearing in mind, we're just in phase two of OTAs. Uh, you can hit us up on Facebook.com forward slash the Pewtercast, or you can find us on Twitter at the Pewtercast. Or if you want to send us maybe your 53-man roster or something else that takes more than 140 characters, email us to thepewtercast at gmail.com. Well, Ren, as we get out of here, do you got any final thoughts? I do. Uh, it just seems like everything's coming together for this team. Uh, every time you feel like they have a roster hole uh, or a spot that you're a little uh, unsure of, Jason Light does his best to fill it, you know, a la uh, the Fitzpatrick uh signing um i'm very interested to see if this doug martin talk to green bay goes anywhere but i'd like to end my last thing i say on this show i'd like to say congratulations again to kevin sloan uh he is trying to get he has been talking about this hashtag that he likes he wants to make it the uh buccaneers official you know like it was siege the day I don't know if that's what it is this year. They kind of change it, you know, the Lightning and, and the Rays. Sorry, other two Tampa teams. They kind of change it every year. We don't know what the what the Bucks are going to do, but he is going with hashtag We Are the Bay, and that's a tip of the hat to you, Kevin. I'm sending that out there. Anyone wants to pick it up on Twitter? Kevin Sloan. Hashtag We Are the Bay. Hashtag We Are the Bay. I like it. I like. It. I think it's a final thought for me. Uh, it, it was real simple. We haven't even started yet, y'all. This this is I think this is going to be such a fun a fun year, and and it's not even started for as much fun as we've been having here in the off season, for as much just amazing stuff that's happened here over just the last couple of months. We've not even gotten started yet, and I can't wait uh, for this season uh, to get started. Uh, well, guys, that's going to do it for us. Uh, so I think, like always, signing off for my buddy Ren. Uh, I am Brent Allen. Until next time, Bucks fans, go Bucks. All right. I can't believe you brought up Tom Jones. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who did. It was just, it was like a side comment and it turned into, I'm going to tell a Tom Jones story. Here's my Tom Jones story.